What's up, YouTube? Welcome back for another video. In today's video, we're actually releasing a three-hour version of our Linux Privilege Escalation for Beginners course. If you've ever taken a hacking course before, or you've ever done a little bit of hacking, you may know that you sometimes land on a machine, and when you land on a machine, you're not a root user or an administrative user, and you have to escalate those privileges. Well, that's what this course is about. What happens when you land on a Linux machine and you're not a root user? How do you escalate privileges? Well, I'm going to show you in this course. This course is actually a shortened, condensed version of what is known as the same titled course on our academy. This is the only time I'm going to pitch you anything in this course. What you're getting out of this course is three hours out of a six and a half hour or so curriculum. We're going to go from the introduction all the way through the SUID path right here, this escalation path of SUID. We're going to stop here, and this will give you a very strong foundation of what to look for and what to do for escalation. Now, if you want to continue on throughout the course, there is this escalation path for more SUID, capabilities, scheduled tasks, etc. And then there's also a capstone challenge that's in the course that's not going to be in this YouTube video. So if you're interested in unlocking the other three and a half hours of the course, you can do so via our academy. I'll drop a link below. Otherwise, this is completely free. It still gives you a ton of knowledge, and it's something that I don't really know if that's out there on YouTube. So spiel done. We're going to go ahead and jump right into the introduction of the course, and I'll catch you over there. Hello, and welcome to Linux Privilege Escalation for Beginners. My name is Heath Adams, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. A quick who am I? I am a husband, hacker, military veteran, gamer, and I have way too many animals, probably past the legal limit. Uh, I am a former accountant turned cybersecurity geek, and on the day-to-day, -day, I am an ethical hacker and business owner at TCM Security, which does ethical hacking and cybersecurity training. You can see a list of my certifications below, all ranging from your basic certifications all the way up to advanced penetration testing and ethical hacking certifications. If you are looking to find me on social media, you could find me at the name of The Cyber Mentor. I do have a Twitch channel for live streaming, a YouTube channel which has other hacking videos and career advice. And if you wanted to reach out to me, you can reach out to me at easiest uh, over at Twitter. And lastly, I do have a couple other Udemy courses. One is Practical Ethical Hacking, which has over 150,000 students at this time of recording, and Windows Privilege Escalation for Beginners, which is the counterpart to this Linux course. So if you need anything from me, that's how you reach out to me. Moving on, let's talk about why this course. So the main reason is to gain a better understanding of privilege escalation techniques. And what is privilege escalation? Well, let's say that you land on a machine. You've hacked a machine, you land on it, and you are not system user, you're not administrator, you're not root of that machine. You are a lower level user. And then you want to take over that machine, you want to compromise it. Well, you need to escalate your privileges. And there are many techniques out there for both Windows, which we've covered in another course, and Linux, which we're going to be covering in this course, that can allow you to do that. So this course is going to help you gain an understanding on how to go from that low-level user to that high-level user. And it's also going to help you improve your Capture the Flag skill set. So if you are looking to compete in Capture the Flag events, if you are looking to do better on websites like Hack the Box or Try Hack Me or CyberSec Labs, this is really going to help you understand how you get from that low-level user and really escalate your skills to escalate machines. And lastly, it's going to help you prepare for certification courses. So the OSCP, the CEH, the eLearn Security, PTS, PTP, PTX, a lot of certifications out there are now moving towards this practical exam environment. So they have boxes that you have to hack into, and not all of them are going to hack directly into a root user. You actually have a low-level user, and you have to escalate. So if you're looking to pass some of these certification courses, you're going to need to understand how to do privilege escalation and be decent at it. With that being said, let's talk about the prerequisites and requirements of this course. 
So this course does require some ethical hacking knowledge. If you do not have ethical hacking knowledge, you're probably gonna be pretty lost. And I would recommend that you start at the practical ethical hacking course. So this course does not hold your hand in terms of ethical hacking knowledge. It assumes that you know basics of how to use Linux, what a shell or reverse shell or bind shell is, how to do some basic file transfers and other commands. It, it basically requires you to have a basic understanding of ethical hacking. If you don't have that, again, there are other courses that you probably should take as a prerequisite. You also need a ethical hacking workstation. Most of us use Linux, but if you use Windows, that's fine too. Whatever you like to utilize for your ethical hacking workstation, you're gonna need that for this course. The bottom two are optional. Now, access to a Windows machine is optional. If you use a Windows machine, that's fine. Or if you've got a VM for it, that's fine. If not, not really a big deal. There's one machine in this course that is going to be a buffer overflow type machine. I'm just doing that to kind of prepare you for your skill set if you're looking to take exams such as the OSCP or the PTP that have buffer overflow elements, then you should be practicing that and I'm kind of incorporating that into this course. So I'll be utilizing a Windows machine to do that. You don't have to utilize Windows, you can use Linux if you're comfortable with that as well. But that's the only time we're going to use Windows and it's at the very end of this course. And lastly, a subscription to try hack me. This entire course is built on TryHackMe's platform, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but TryHackMe is providing this all for free to us. So if you go to the website, anything I show you, all you have to do is register for an account. However, there are benefits to having the subscription-based access, it being that you get your own dedicated machine, things run a little bit faster, you get access to more machines and more items within the website. Now I get no kickbacks whatsoever. And again, this is all free, completely optional. You can choose to do it or not, but it is my recommendation that it is well worth the subscription or the $10 or so for one month subscription to try hack me. But we'll cover the website here in a later section. And when we talk about our labs and et cetera, let's talk about what you're going to learn. And that's probably why you're here and what you want to know. So the big thing is we're going to learn how to enumerate Linux systems manually and then with tools. I think enumeration is the biggest and most important part of hacking. The better you are at enumeration, the better hacker you're going to be. So we're going to focus on how to do that manually and then I'll show you automated tools. And then we'll kind of go through each of these escalation techniques and I'll show you how to do some of this hunting manually and then how you can identify them with your tools as well. So on this list of techniques you're going to see, we're going to talk about kernel exploits, password hunting, file permissions. There's several pseudo exploits we're going to perform, including a couple of recent CVEs from 2019 that I'm really excited about. We'll talk about SUID attacks. We'll talk about capabilities attacks, NFS, scheduled tasks being cron jobs and system D timers. And we'll also do a Docker privilege escalation exploit. In total, you're going to do 11 vulnerable machines in this lab. So 11 vulnerable machines, you'll get tons of practice. That doesn't include the custom lab that you're gonna be doing. So really there's like 12 vulnerable machines in this lab, and there will be a capstone challenge of five machines. So I will be testing your knowledge once you get to the capstone to see how well you can perform on your own with everything that you've learned in the course. Last but not least, there are important resources that I cannot show you in the introduction video. Mainly what I'm after is I want to introduce you to the Discord channel. Now we have a Discord channel of at this time over 15,000 people. We have channels for the Practical Ethical Hacking course, we have channels for the Windows course, and we'll have a channel for the Linux course. So I'll introduce you to that and why that's important. But in order to do that, you're gonna to have to check out the bonus video per Udemy policy. So scroll to the very last video in this course and check out the bonus video before you start. The Discord section will be a great place for you to come ask questions, get real-time help, and communicate with other students that are also working through the course. With that being said, that brings us to the end of this introduction video. I'm very excited to see where this course goes and learn with you. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're gonna talk about resources and important course tips that will lead you to success.
Before we dive headfirst into this course, I need to provide you with some resources that will benefit you when it comes to privilege escalation on Linux, and I kind of want to give you some overall advice. So I'm going to share with you a few resources that I love to utilize when I'm doing privilege escalation. These are cheat sheets, something that I can quickly refer to, and you'll find your own. You'll see which ones you like, which ones you don't like, and kind of make this your own. So I'll start with this Got Milk blog that I utilized when I was going through certifications. And it's really, really great. It's a little dated. It's from 2011. And it's really just more for enumeration and what to look for. And it just goes in full detail. Look at all the different things that you can look for. But when I say full detail, it gives you all different kinds of ways to check for things. Like if we're looking for what the distribution type is or what the kernel version is or hey, is there a printer in this environment? And we'll cover some of these commands, but not nearly as in detail as this goes into with quick copy and paste tricks. And that's what a lot of these are. This one is saying, hey, here's a lot of different ways that you can enumerate. And I was reading through this again, and I really like the way that Got Milk puts this. There is no magic answer for privilege escalation. There is just a lot of work and enumeration is key. That is absolutely true. Enumeration is the biggest differentiator between, in my opinion, between a good hacker and someone that just doesn't end up getting it because they don't spend enough time on enumeration. So make sure that you understand that you have to kind of go through this step by step. You might not utilize every guide, but you might utilize more than one guide when you're kind of looking through these things. So the Got Milk is kind of the initial very, very well known one. However, I do think there are some that have come along that are maybe better or more put together. Uh, one of those is payloads all the things. If you come through here, this has a nice tools and checklist and kind of gives you actually, you'll see some some different options here. So like if you're looking for a scheduled task, for example, you can click on scheduled task, drop all the way down to that. And this is how you check for scheduled tasks and how you determine them. Or how about system D timers? So you got cron job system D timers, or maybe you're looking for SUID exploits. And this could all sound foreign to you right now because we haven't covered them. But this is telling you how to look for specific things and what you're looking for, why you're looking for it even. So I really do appreciate this version uh, and this checklist because it does cover quite a bit more just because it's a little bit newer than the Got Milk guide. On top of that, there are the hack tricks that it's one of my favorite websites too because it's put together by uh, Carlos Polyp, who is the author of LinPs and WinPs and some great scripts that we'll cover in this course and I've covered in other courses as well. But he provides a checklist. So you get in, what are the first things you might look for? Vulnerable kernel, that makes sense. Uh, maybe processes, known users, passwords, and you can click on these and just kind of see, okay, well, what options do I have when it comes to a vulnerable kernel? And here you go, kernel exploits. What are we looking for in kernel exploits? Well, we might want to know the version, we might want to know the distribution, the, the uname, and we might want to look for the kernel that we're running to see if there's any sort of kernel exploit available to that. Here's some tools that are available for hunting these down, and it's just, it's really awesome stuff. Uh, and last but not least is we have this guide as well, this uh, Sushant 747. I'm probably butchering that, but uh, this is very well put together and concise. So just, hey, let's search for these sorts of things. So uh, you don't know what you're really getting into. And as I guide you into this course, I will give you the methodology on how I would hunt the easy wins. And then we're just going to have to dive in and kind of hunt. If we don't see something right off the bat, we're going to really have to sink our teeth in and dig deeper and try to find some of these through enumeration. So we'll come up with a decent methodology. Everybody kind of has their own, but I'll give you mine and how I hunt down these things. And hopefully we will improve. So the one thing I want to point out too, just for general advice or course tip is to make sure that you're taking notes. There are plenty of good note taking applications out there. I personally use one called Keep Note. However, Cherry Tree is built into Kali Linux right here. You can see Cherry Tree. That's a great note taking platform. There are there's Notion, there's Joplin, there's all kinds out there. So I do recommend taking notes, kind of making your own guide and just understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Don't just rush through this 
make sure you understand the reasoning behind this. And if there's something that you don't understand the first time through, maybe watch the video again. Make sure you're understanding everything before you're moving forward. And I don't claim to be the best instructor for everything. So if there's something that I am doing and you just don't get it, you might need to utilize outside resources and have somebody else teach you and maybe that'll make it click. So I, I shouldn't be your only resource. Please do utilize other resources and make sure that it, you get the full picture and you understand uh, before you move on to the next lesson. So that is it. We're going to go ahead and jump into our introduction to try hack me and our platform utilized for this lab and how we're going to access the lab and gain our initial shell. So I will see you over in the next section. All right, are you ready to get started and learn about your lab and get access to your lab? I'm ready for it. So in this lab, I'm going to be utilizing my Kali Linux machine. I'm using Kali Linux 2019.3. So if you want to follow along with what I'm doing on the same operating system, that's absolutely fine. If you want to use a newer version of Kali, that's fine. If you want to use Parrot, that's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with, even if you use Windows, that's absolutely okay. Just make sure that you're capable of following along with what I'm doing. So with that all being said, we're going to be using a website called Try Hack Me. So if I go out to the web and you go to https uh, double dot slash slash tryhackme.com, you'll be brought to the Try Hack Me website. So go ahead and get registered. It's completely free. I have no kickbacks to this website. I have no referral link, nothing. I am just that big of a fan. Now, everything that you're going to do is going to be completely free with me. There are paid options. I think it's like 10 to 13 bucks a month to actually have a VIP subscription. The VIP gets you access to a lot more machines. It gets you access to faster, faster boxes, better lab environment, etc. But you can absolutely perform everything I'm going to show you 100% free at the time of recording for this. So what you're going to do is you come on to Try Hack Me. Now, this is the dashboard. You'll have your dashboard. You can see how many rooms are out there, what the users are, what are some suggested rooms for you. There are actually learning paths that are really cool on this site as well. If you're a complete beginner, uh, you can enroll in that path. Or if you're looking to do a certification, the offensive pen testing one's pretty good. They've got all different primers as well. But what we're going to be interested in primarily are the hacktivities. And I'll show you this in each video, but you're just going to go to the hacktivities. And this is going to show you all the boxes that are out there. Now, this is going to be called priv -esque Arena, and if you type it in right, if, when I type it in right now, you're going to see that it's not available to you yet. Uh, it's not available publicly yet because I haven't launched the course, thus I haven't launched the actual room, but I'm going to show you the room here in a second. Here's an example of the Windows priv -esque Arena that we used for the Windows Escalation course. So if we go over to this room, and it's going to be tryhackme.com forward slash room forward slash Linux priv -esque Arena. Of course, I will put this link in the resources, but you're going to come into here and you're going to have all of your connection options. So you come in, you're going to join the room. There'll be a little join room button. And then this is going to tell you how to get connected to the open VPN room. If you've never done that before, your first time through, you're going to need to download an open VPN file and get connected via open VPN. Very straightforward. You just download the file. And then when you come into here, you'll just say something along the lines of open VPN. And you'll say whatever file you downloaded .ovpn. And that'll get you connected to the network. Once you IF config, you should see that you have a tunnel available to you. So here's my tunnel connection right here. I have my INET, uh, which is my IPv4 connection. And I'm good to go. So you should see something very similar once you actually get connected. Now, once you deploy the room and you are good to go, you come in here. Once you join the room and you're connected to the VPN, you just come in here and you deploy the room. OK, so you hit deploy. And when you deploy the room, you're going to get an IP address. So you can see I got 10.10.46.210. .10 All right. And I'm just going to copy this. And when you utilize this, you just copy it and you're going to SSH over to it. I'm going to show you an example on my network because I actually have the box running over here. So I've got the box right here running. I'm just going to connect to it for the entirety of the labs. I'm connecting to my home machine. However, that's just for ease of access and recording purposes. You can completely come in here and SSH to the IP address. Give it about two to three minutes before 
You can even run ping checks on it. So you can do a ping against it and make sure that it's up. As you can see, it's only been 40 seconds and it's not up yet. It does take a minute to spit up. So give it some time. For my sake, I'm going to SSH and I'm going to SSH using the username of TCM. And I'm going to do it to 192.168.4.67. You would just utilize this IP address here. SSH in and the password is hacker with a capital H123. And you should get logged into your lab environment. Now, here are the credentials. They're right here in the lab, okay? So you see username hacker123. It tells you everything you need to do. If you, every tool you need is going to be in your user folder. So throughout this course, if you LS in here, you could see that we have, uh, we've got shells in here. We've got all kinds of di different things in here. We've got tools. Um, you won't have this access actually. You'll just have the VPN file and tools, but we'll build these out a little bit later. If you CD into tools, and LS, you'll see that we have different exploits and things we're going to be utilizing throughout the course. So there should be no downloading throughout the course unless there's a tool that you see me use that you want to use uh, in terms of walkthroughs and stuff like that. So it's very straightforward. On top of that, we're going to be utilizing all the different tasks in here. So you see task one, task two. So say you connected to the Try Hack Me network. OK, you completed that task. It'll turn green. You're good to go. On the next one, you say, hey, I deployed this machine. I am now logged in uh, as the user via SSH. So good job. I'm, I'm done there. Now we go into the first task, which is going to be kernel exploits. I encourage you to watch the videos and follow along that way. But you can come through here as well and get credit once you're complete. If there's anything that was you missed or you just didn't understand, in here gives you step-by-step -step directions on how to completely do step-by-step -step everything that I did and allow you to still gain access via what I just did. So you can complete the task as well. And then if you look through, all the tasks in the course are going to com be completed in here. Now, everything that you see here is part of the course. There are more machines and boxes. So this is counting as one machine. In total, we're going to touch on 11 different machines in the course. So not everything is going to be done in this lab, though a lot is going to be done. You can see all the different tasks that we have to do. So just keep note that I will inform you, hey, we're back in our lab or, hey, we're going to be attacking this box. So I'll give you clear indication what we're going to be doing. Otherwise, all you need to do here is just go through step by step, follow the video. If you see a video called kernel exploits and you see kernel exploits in here, you're good to go. If you see one called stored passwords, guess what? You're going to be following stored passwords. So just follow along that way and you're going to be absolutely OK. With that being said, the first thing we're going to do before we do any of these tasks or task three, we're going to start working with initial enumeration. So I'm going to see you in the next section where we're doing enumeration. We're learning some command line, understanding what we're searching for and why we're searching for it. And then we'll start moving into the actual exploitation after that. So I'll catch you over in the next section. OK, we have exploited our machine. We've got a low level shell, which is being simulated here with our SSH. We are now logged in as a user named TCM. This user is not a root user, and we need to elevate our privileges. Now, if we go back to the fundamentals of hacking, there are five stages of hacking. The first three stages are information gathering, then scanning and enumeration, and then exploitation. So going back to our roots, we've got access to the machine. So we had to do at least those first three steps. We did scanning enumeration. We did our exploitation. We got there. Now we're in and we have a shell. We have to repeat that process. We have to go back and do more enumeration. And so what we're going to cover in these next few videos is the initial enumeration steps that we should be taking. This is not all inclusive. We're going to learn how to do more enumeration as we come across different escalation paths. But these are the key or critical ones that you might just quickly look at to see if you could find quick wins without running any sort of tools. So first up, we're going to look at system enumeration. So we're on the system, and we want to just take a look at what we're working with. Right now, we could see Debian, but that's just the host name. If we type in host name, we can see that as well. So that's just an indicator that we're on a Debian machine, but a better indicator of that might be doing uname-a. 
which is going to tell us what our kernel is here. And we're running on Linux Debian 2.6.32. This is super important to know. And you can see we're running 8664 here, AMD 64. So all indicators are 64-bit machine. We run uname-a to use this in searching for exploitations. The first exploit we're going to look at is what's called a kernel exploit. And we'll talk about that here soon. But we might just copy this Linux Debian 2.6.32, put that into Google and say, hey, are there any exploits for this? And just see what pops up. So uname-a is super important to look for and kind of hunting those easy wins down. We could also take a look at something like cat proc version to do something similar. We can take a look at the Etsy issue like this. And you can see the distribution here. Now, if we wanted to take a quick peek at the architecture, we could just do something like LS CPU. And you can see that we are running on 64 bit architecture. Here's anything about the CPU that you want to know how many threads, how many CPUs, what's the vendor type, etc. And this may come into play. I've actually seen some types of exploits where it requires multiple threads or multiple cores. So if you look at this or you're up against an exploit and it says, hey, this exploit requires four cores and you do LS CPU and you see one core, guess what? The exploit's probably not going to work for you. So it's a good way to narrow down architectures are the most important out of this, but knowing the threads and the, the core count actually is useful information as well. So another thing that we might want to check out while we're in here that's system related is what services are running. So we could do something like PS AUX like this and to see what services are running. If you're a Windows user primarily, this is just like looking at your service manager and seeing what tasks are running or your task manager, seeing what tasks are running. And we can come in here and just kind of scroll down from the top. You could see that it goes by what user is running what task or command. So if we go all the way down to the bottom, it goes in the order that they were issued. Here you could see that we just logged in the machine via SSH. We're utilizing Bash and we just executed this PSAUX. So we're active a little bit. We can see that we're active, but we can also see some other things. We can see if we come through here that there's an Nginx server running with www data. Uh, I see Apache running. So there's got to be a web server probably on this machine. I also see Roots running cron, which is like a scheduled task. We'll talk about that later. I see a network file share. We'll talk about that later. So this is just some things that you could be looking at, or these are things that you could be looking at just to say, hey, What's going on here? What user is running what task? And let's say that you're just curious more so about the root user. You could say, hey, what user, what, what tasks are running as the root user? So you could just grep the root out of this. And then you're going to pull down all root users. And I'll make this a little bigger. And the one command here will pull down the root for this. But everything else is root. And you can see, OK, here are all the processes that root is running right now. Or if you were curious about yourself, you could say TCM and see what processes you're running right now. So this is just a quick and dirty way to look at some system information. The big things we're after uh, on the quick enumeration or initial enumeration is we're trying to pull down that, that kernel version. What, what kernel are we on? Uh, is it vulnerable to anything? And what architecture are we on? Because that's important as well. Of course, we could look at the cores if we need to. Understanding your host name is somewhat important sometimes, and uh, the PS AUX command to see the services running. A little bit backtracking and why I said the, the host name before leaving that there. The host name is important because sometimes in capture the flag style events, the host name will be related to one of the exploits on hand. For example, if the exploit is called blue or the machine is called blue, the host name, it might be an eternal blue exploit. Or if the box, I've seen a box called Jerry, that might be related to a Tomcat exploit. So it's always useful to know the host name when you hop onto it, because that host name may give you an indicator as to what exploit is coming, at least from a capture the flag perspective. So that's it for this video. We're going to go ahead and move on now to user enumeration. Moving on to user enumeration, we're going to perform user enumeration to find out who we are, what permissions we have, and what we're capable of doing. 
And we could do that with a few quick initial commands. And then as we move on, we can learn more commands that we can take advantage of. So initially, we're going to just do a quick who am I, even though we can see it here. We are TCM. Here's your host name. More so, we could do an ID and see what our user ID is. Here you could see it's a thousand or a group ID of a thousand. This is telling me that we are just in the user group. We're not a root user. We don't have any sort of administration or administrative privileges here that I can identify right away. We also want to look for what privileges we might have. So we're going to look at the sudo command to see what we can run as sudo and do a sudo dash L. And well, we have quite a bit here. I'm going to save this information for you for later, but at quick glance, it looks like we can run quite a few commands as the root user with no password, meaning we could say sudo nano and then a file here because it says, hey, there's no password required to run nano as sudo. So we can do that without any sort of password for root. That's great. Now we'll go more into detail on how we could take advantage of a situation like this, as well as the LD preload. So we know what privileges we have. We could also start looking at some files. So maybe something like the Etsy password. And in the Etsy password, we could see the users, not the password. Unfortunately, that's where the password used to be stored back in the day. But now they have this nice little placeholder for an X. And we can see here that we have the root user, of course, and we have TCM. The rest of these look pretty non standard to me. Uh, they are while well, they're standard, they're just not users. You could see here, starting at 1000, we've got TCM. And then if we had a few users, they would be towards the bottom, typically. And then we have our root towards the top. Now, if we wanted to kind of narrow this down, we could also do that. There's all kinds of little kung fu commands we could do. We could do something like cat Etsy password, and we can maybe just cut this. We could say cut on a delimiter of a colon, and then we'll do a field of one, meaning like here's a delimiter, here's a delimiter, here's a delimiter, here's field one, two, three. So when I run this command, I should just pull down all the users. And OK, so we kind of cut out all that other junk. And you can see here are the users on the machine. Uh, the rest of these look standard, like I said, with this being a user and this being root. So we've only got two real users on this machine here. Now we can look and see if we have access to any sort of sensitive files, maybe like cat Etsy shadow. And we do, and we'll discuss this later as to why this is bad and what we can do with it. But these are the type of things you might want to look for. What what files do I know of and what files can I maybe access? Can we access perhaps the Etsy group file? And we can access the Etsy group file as well. So these are the sort of things we want to kind of look at and see what we're capable of, who we are, what pseudo permissions we have, and what sensitive file access we have. We'll go more into sensitive files here in just a little bit as we progress through the course. Last but not least, we might want to look at our history and see if there's anything juicy in history. And you can see some commands that I've been running here, but there there is history stored here. So maybe there's some something interesting in here. We'll talk about this a little bit later, too. But you always want to look through the history. And if I'm hopping onto a machine, the first couple of things that I'm doing right away is I'm figuring out who I am. I'm figuring out what the architecture of the system is, what pseudo privileges I have and what history is available to me. Those are absolutely the quick wins. If I can do a quick just immediate history find and find a password, or if I can do a sudo command, even a sudo switch user dash like this, and you can see that I can try to do a hacker123 for the password, and we're not allowed to do that. Uh, so it's always worth trying to see if we can sudo escalate into a different user as well, or the root user, but we're not able to do that here. So all these quick little wins, quick enumeration, easy to do, easy to find uh, some things here. It's already juicy information showing up on this machine. So with that being said, that's kind of the basics that I want you to know. We're going to move on now to network enumeration. So I will see you in the next video when we cover that. Next up are the commands for enumerating the network. Now, network enumeration is super important. It lets us understand what our IP architecture is, what 
we're interacting with and what maybe open ports there are available to us internally that might not be exposed externally just kind of gives us a lay of the land. So I'm going to show you a couple different commands to execute uh, depending on the old versions versus kind of the new version. So some of these won't work, but I'm still going to type them anyway. Now, depending on the version of Linux that you're on, the old command would be ifconfig. And you can do an ifconfig and see if you can print out your information. Here, you could also just do an IPA and pull down the old ifconfig or the new ifconfig and see what your IP address is. So you can see here I've got a 192.168.467 and I'm on a slash 22 network. Uh, and you can see broadcast address is a dot seven dot two fifty five. So I have what our INET here is. And on top of this, what's useful is sometimes these machines can be dual homed. So meaning that we have one IP address, maybe 192.168.4, and then maybe we have like a second IP address of 10.10. whatever. And that machine can communicate with two networks because it has two different NICs running in it. That could also be true if it has a route. So it used to be a command of route. We could just say IP route here. And if there was a route maybe to another network that we identify here, that would be useful as well. You can see we have 192.168.4 network and we're sourcing that through our IP address via the default gateway of 192.168.4.1. So we have at least one route in here, but there's potential to have other routes. Another way to look at that too is with ARP tables. ARP tables will tell us who we're communicating with, and maybe there's a machine that we're talking with kind of back and forth or something along those lines, and maybe there's traffic being generated across the network that we can identify as who we're interacting with. So that could be useful as well. And the command for that would be ARP-A, which isn't going to work here, but the new command would be IP -ne, N E I G H. And you can see what has gone stale here and what is reachable. Now I'm communicating across this 4.51 network. So this 4.51 is me, we are reachable, and these other two are stale, but have been identified as at some point being in the network. So lastly, the command I want to show you is netstat. I always do switches of ANO. Now this is, most of these are just like Windows. And if you took the Windows course, we covered these as well. But you want to identify what ports are open, as well as what communications exist. Say we had a shell on this machine, and we come in here, and we can see that other machines are talking to our machine over different ports or there's established connections that would send my spidey senses off and say, hey, maybe there's something that I need to exploit between these two machines or that I need to identify as a potential exploit. Maybe there's traffic flowing or something I need to intercept here to really uh, exploit this machine. Other things that we want to identify are things like this, this port 961. It doesn't look to be open to anything but the local host here, 127001. So we have this, and we don't have this exposed externally. Our Nmap scan didn't identify this. So what's it doing? What is 961 doing internally on UDP? So these are things that we will kind of want to be thinking about in just exploring on the machine. Most importantly, just get the lay of the land. That's really what we want to know about the network. What ports are open? Who are we communicating with? Who's out there? What is our network? And what networks do we have access to? So that is it for this video. We're going to go ahead and move on to password hunting in the next video. Moving on to password hunting. We're going to just spend a couple minutes here. We're not going to go into too much detail because we have a whole section dedicated to this here coming up. But the quick dirty commands that I want to show you for password hunting and sensitive file hunting are pretty neat. So let's say that we want to look for passwords and we want to actually color coordinate this. We can use the grep command and we could do color dash dash color equals auto. And then we're going to do a switch of dash rnw with a forward slash in single quotes. And then we're going to provide our term that we're going to search for. So here I'm going to search for password. And then I'm just going to say color equals always. Now we're going to spit that out to dev null like this. 
And what this is going to do is this is going to go out and look for the word password anywhere in files, and it's going to spit it out in red so that we can read it. It's a very, very nice command. So let's go ahead and run this. And I'm going to I'm going to kill it at some point. But let's just kind of scroll through here and see what we've got. Now we can kind of see that we just are pulling down the word password uh, and any and all different things here. Uh, so if the word password is found, it's going to identify it. And maybe we need to make this a little bit better. Uh, we have the word password, but maybe we need to do something like, I don't know, password equals, and maybe that'll narrow down some of the, the finds that we do here. So we'll do a password equals, and maybe that'll hunt something down instead of just finding the word password for everything, because that could just really overwhelm us. If you look at what we just found here in just seconds, we might just want to hunt the word password equals and see where that goes. So I'm going to go ahead and control C. I'm just trying to give you ideas at this point. But there you can see password just came through here. Um, and that is just a, a user share and map script that came back. So um, nothing, nothing there for us. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and control C. And another thing that we might want to do is we might want to look for the phrase password uh, as a file name. So what if we say something like locate password and then we do something like more, we pipe more. And then we could see anywhere that there is the word password here in a file name. And we might be able to identify a file containing sensitive passwords here. We could do the same thing and narrow it down. Maybe passwords too long. We might just do pass like this. We might do uh, PWD or something along those lines. And I'm going to control C here again. So just be thinking outside the box. It could be a lot of different things. It might not just be password. It might be pass or anything else. Now, another thing that we can do is we can hunt down uh, SSH keys. So maybe there are SSH keys on this machine that we have access to, and that might provide us access to another user or to a different machine in the network. So it's always important to kind of hunt those down. We can kind of do a find forward slash dash name. And we could look for either authorized keys, which is a good one, authorized keys. Or we could look for ID RSA like this and put that to dev null. Search that. And we found something called backup super secret keys ID RSA. That looks pretty interesting, too. So the big takeaway here for now in terms of password hunting is that we need to be able to get decent at searching through files. Because if we just use the term password, you could see that a lot of things come back. And it's not beyond you to look through these. I, I absolutely encourage you to come through here and just look and read and see if you can identify. And some of the deepest and best enumeration I have done has been going through hundreds, if not thousands of lines just to find that one password hiding somewhere. So it's very possible that when you actually do search based on this color here, that you might have to do password equals or pass equals or even password and just deal with it and see what happens. But there are all types of commands that you can run to kind of hunt these down. Once we get into automated tools, it'll make life a little bit easier for you to kind of search for these and still see them in a visual perspective. So hang tight for that. Don't feel too overwhelmed quite yet and just be thinking hey I want to look for I want to look for passwords I want to look for any sort of sensitive file that might contain the word password or even other things as we start to learn more about files that might be interesting uh, SSH keys etc but again we have a whole section on this coming up so I just want to introduce you to the topic and we'll come back to it as we we get to it so uh, from here we're going to move on to looking at automated tools so we're going to take a look at a few of my favorite tools that I like to use when I'm doing privilege escalation on Linux machines and see how they could take some of what I just showed you and automate the process, and make it way easier than hunting this manually. So, of course, we have to learn the manual methods to understand what the automated tools are doing. But now that we've learned some of these details, we can kind of go back and see what some of the files that are being hunted, what sort of things are being hunted by these automated tools. And it's really, really neat. So. I'll catch you in the next section as we start talking about automated tools.
Welcome to this section on exploring automated tools. So up until this point, we have just been working with command line, running some basic commands, and we have just been learning the ways of the manual methods. Now we're going to look at some tools that will do what we've done and multiply that probably to the 10th power in terms of search capability, finding vulnerabilities, and just spitting out output very quick and a lot faster than we could do on our own. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite tools. I've got four picked out and I've actually already loaded three of these onto a machine or onto this machine. And if you want the four tool, you can go ahead and download that as well. So let's go ahead and go to Google. I've already got all of these loaded and I will be providing these in the course resources. So don't fret if you can't find them. There will be links available if you click on the resources next to this video. So the first tool is my favorite by far. This is LinPs, which is the Linux Privilege Escalation Awesome script. If you took the Windows Privilege Escalation course, you saw the WinPs version of this. This tool is just absolutely amazing. So it goes through, it color coordinates everything, it hunts down all these vulnerabilities. You can see here this little sudo dash L, it might be kind of small. But even just for a quick example, we talked about sudo dash L. It's pulling down sudo dash L and seeing what the user can run with no password. It's going to hunt down as much information as possible. So let me make this a little bit smaller again. Super easy to download and install is just a .sh. So it's going to run in bash. There's no real dependencies or anything that we have to really worry about. Now, on top of that, we have uh, similar tools. So we've got linenum.sh, same kind of concept. It's going to go out there, it's going to enumerate, it's going to spit out information. Now I am an advocate of running linpeas first and then kind of going through with other tools. Say you run linpeas and you just don't see anything, nothing stands out to you, then maybe it's time to move on, run a different tool. I have in the past many times found that one tool completely missed something that the other tool caught. So it's always important to run multiple tools to know about them. And that's why I'm introducing you to not just one, because not one is just perfect. They all have their own little niche. So linenum.sh is one that I have used for years before linpeas and was kind of my go to. Linpeas has taken that over, but it doesn't mean that's not still a good tool and that it's not being updated. It's been updated within the last five months. So that's pretty good. Uh, another one is the Linux exploit suggester. And you can always tell a good tool from or a popular tool from the amount of stars they have on GitHub. This one has almost 2000 and this was updated three days ago. So this one is up to date. It's going well. This one will actually suggest different exploits based on what it's reading from the machine. So you could see uh, it'll run it and then it'll say, hey, here is the exploits that we are suggesting to you. So it's kind of like the Windows exploit suggester. Or it's even like if you're thinking like the Metasploit suggester, it's just kind of like that where it says, hey, I'm identifying certain characteristics or traits of this machine. Based on that, you should be looking at this exploit. And here's where you can find details about that exploit. Here's the download URL for that exploit, etc. Uh, so super nice, very easy to use. We'll run all three of these and just kind of see what the output is. The last one is LinuxPrivChecker.py. So say you're in a situation where uh, you have Python on a machine and you're just not finding anything. This would be a good one to use as well. I use this all the time back in the day, and this was also updated eight days ago. So uh, very, very up to date. All of these, they're staying up to date. That's great. Now with this, I have already put these on the machine. So what we'll do is if you come into your machine here and you just do a LS from your home folder, you will see that there is a tools folder. So if you CD tools, you LS in here, there's a few things in here, but what we're concerned about right now is the Linenum, Linpeas, and the Linux exploit suggester. So go ahead and CD over to Linpeas, and I will catch you over in the next video when we start to run these different ones, and I'll explain some of the output that we're seeing and why it's important to us. So go ahead and meet me over in the next video as we start to walk through some of these automated tools. All right, let's run some of these tools, shall we? So let's start with linpeas. Now, if we just ls, we can see here we've got linpeas.sh. All we have to do is linpeas.sh. 
Hit enter and whoa, that thing is flying. It's in pretty color. Limp piece is amazing. So if yours isn't flying that fast, that's absolutely okay. Uh, just give it some time. If you need to pause, go ahead and pause. I'm gonna scroll back up and just kind of show you what this does, what it's capable of, and we'll kind of run through some of these tools. So let's scroll all the way up if we can. There's a lot here. Okay, so this is supposed to be a Ninja Turtle. Uh, didn't come out quite as clear on our, our screen, but I uh, have seen it more Ninja Turtle-like in other machines. So anyway, if we take a look at the legend here, we see the red slash yellow is a 99% chance that it's a privilege escalation vector. This is pretty spot on. I don't know if I'd give it 99%, but it's pretty high that you need to at least look into it. Uh, the red you should also look into, and then this kind of just gives you other legends. But I always stop here if I see a red or a red yellow, kind of take a look. So if we start looking with the basic information, immediately it highlights the 2.6.32 of the Linux version. This is something that we talked about and something that we should look for to see if there's any sort of kernel exploit, which we're going to get into here in just a little bit in a new section. But this is identifying that already for us. And this is just some of the things we looked at. Like this is just doing a uname-a or something along those lines. This is doing a ID, running that here. We're running a host name. It's looking for writable folders, et cetera. So some of the commands that we're running, it's just automatically doing that for us. And you saw how fast this went through. We would not be able to do it this fast. So this is why these automated scripts are super nice. Now you can come through here, it's telling you again more system information, pseudo version, your path information. It's got today's date, if you're curious about that. Uh, we can come through, look at the environment. Are there printers? Uh, what What's is ASLR enabled? There's a lot of information here, maybe even more information than we really need, but we can kind of scroll through and let's just kind of see what we can get uh, an idea on. now. We can see the processes, cron, and services, which we'll talk about later on in the course, but this is just looking at that PSAUX again. And you could tell that it actually ran PSAUX because here we are running LimPs and then it ran PSAUX. It's going to look for binary processes and cron jobs. Uh, we're gonna scroll through this. And you can see here there is a path of home user that's highlighted. So maybe there's something here that could be exploited. Uh, keep going through. We've got network information, kind of what we talked about. We're pulling down uh, DNS information. We've got our IP information here in full detail. Any IP tables, any active ports. Here's our Netstat printout. And you can see the 127001 with this port 961. Remember, we identified that as being interesting. So definitely something that we should look into. Why is there an open port here? Keep scrolling through. We have user information. Was there anything found in clipboard? We didn't find anything in clipboard. Here's our pseudo L. We need to see what's here. We're highlighting this LD preload, which is exploitable. All of these are exploitable too. So it's very interesting. Once we get into the pseudo section, we'll see how we can exploit some of these. Uh, coming through again, we find our super users. Root is identified as a super user, which is true. Users with console, we're in there. And then it provides all users and groups, which we have done with an Etsy password here. Uh, come through who's logged in, we're logged in, who are the last logins. You could see who logged in from where. Uh, I've logged in from a couple of different locations here recently, and it's got that all stored in here. Scrolling through, we can look at the password policy. We can see any sort of software information to define something like MySQL or PostgreSQL. And it isn't finding anything here. So I'm just going to scroll through and see what else we can do. OK, we've got SSH that's permitting a root login. So that's potentially vulnerable. If we can find an SSH file or if we can find the password, we can log in via SSH as the root user, which is very good. Uh, we found something that says no root squash. I wonder what that means. Maybe that'll come up again later in the NFS section. So it's identifying quite a bit. And I, I want you to just take away all the identifications that we're seeing here and keep this in the back of your mind that we're seeing a lot of different things. There's been a lot of yellow. So obviously this machine is pretty vulnerable. We're going to figure out how vulnerable it is as we go on, but there's quite a bit that we can do and it comes in here and says, Hey, what sensitive files can we read? Remember we tried reading some sensitive files and it says, can I read the shadow file? Sure enough, we can read the shadow file. So that's really bad. 
And hey, can I read the root folder? Nope, we can't do that. But hey, we can read the shadow files. So that's pretty good. And what files have been modified in the last five minutes? This is actually pretty good if we're doing some sort of cron job or you can see a backup happening here, something called useless. So what's going on in the last five minutes? What files are being written to this machine? If we're not doing anything, then maybe something on a timer or a schedule is doing these and maybe we could take advantage of that. So that would be something interesting to look at. What's sitting inside of our home folder? You get to see all the information that this is spitting out. And I'm going really fast, but this is just... Uh, things that you know we can just identify. Look, there's this backup coming here. Uh, it looks for any kind of .old files or backup files. So we're just trying to identify some of these things. Let's keep scrolling through, see, and now it's looking for possible passwords inside of Bash history. Oh, look, it found a potential password there. So that's interesting. Uh, you could see some commands that I was running with the, the word password in there as well. So it's finding SUID bits, it looks like, or interesting writable files for us. Um, and the list just goes on and on. Here, we're searching for the passwords inside of logs, and it's only limiting it to 70 because you saw the printout that we did before where there was a bunch of passwords printed out when we searched for password, way more than 70. Um, it's looking for emails. It's looking for a lot of stuff. So let's keep scrolling through. And now we're at the bottom. You can see it's looking for potential passwords here. It looks like we found uh, maybe a client secret. So it's looking for client secrets here. It's looking for uh, username, password here as well. So that is a quick rundown. I'm almost out of breath because of all the information that it just spewed out at us. And I don't expect you to understand everything right now. The, the big takeaway is, wow, what information did we just get? Okay, and what are we trying to identify? Visually, we're trying to identify first look through this script. We're trying to see what's that red yellow. If we don't identify any red yellow, then we go through another pass through and say, what's in red? What are we missing here? What do we need to look at? And we just kind of go through this list. Do we see any interesting passwords in here? And not everything that was that's vulnerable in here was red yellow, right? We did see a password uh, in our history. We, we saw some interesting stuff. I'll see if I can find it, but we did see password in history right here. And we've got root password one, two, three. I wonder what that is. So this didn't highlight whatsoever, but the MySQL did. So we can see red. So I would always go through here, look for the red yellow first, go back, look through the red. If you're not identifying anything, give it another go with another tool. Your eyes will become trained over time on how to look through these scripts, and I am very much a heavy script user when it comes to doing automated enumeration because it's just a time saver. Of course, when I hop onto a machine, like I said earlier in an earlier video, I will absolutely come in here, say, who am I, pseudo L, I'll look at the history, I'm gonna be typing those things out and just seeing what we can do and what we can identify very fast but if I can't identify it, I'm bringing on LinPs very quickly. I'm looking for a writable folder where I can put it and I'm gonna run LinPs. If LinPs doesn't work, then we'll try another tool. So let's take a look at another tool. Let's actually look at the Linux exploit suggester. Now, Linenum, we'll just skip over. Linenum.sh is very similar to LinPs and what it does. It searches through all these things and just tries to uh, find it. If you want to run Linenum, feel free to run it, see what it does. Uh, get some experience with it, and just take your time and read through these things. Uh, just for the time sake of video, I just want to show you two tools instead of making a, uh, a very, very long video here. So we've got Linux Exploit Suggester. Let's go ahead and just do a LS, and we're going to go ahead and just run this as well. Okay, and that was fast. And these are just things that, you know, you it would take you so long to do. Look at all of these potential potential CVEs that came back on this machine. So we've got CVE from 2010 all the way moving forward. And some of these um, are even probably newer than when this machine was released. But I already see a couple vulnerabilities on here, one in particular that we're going to be utilizing and that we should be identifying through this type of uh, exploit searching. So. We'll talk about that as we get into that section, but that's coming up actually in the next video. So we'll kind of play off of what we found and how we can identify that. 
So this is really it. I just want you to get the takeaway of how awesome these automated scripts are. Now, this doesn't make you a script kitty to run this or anything along those lines. It's important, and it's very important to understand what commands were being run before. And that's why I kind of said, hey, let's go through the manual commands first, so that way you can understand when you see some of these things that we were going through, where it's pulling down the OS information or the user information, we kind of know the command being run behind that. And if you're ever actually curious to go through these, you could always just do a, let's go back to Limpies. Actually, we can source code Limpies here. We don't even have to do a nano on the machine. We can go to Limpies.sh. And if you're curious as to what it does, you can go right through here and see. And I mean, the code's just written out beautifully. It tells you exactly what it's doing. And you can read through. I mean, look at this, look at this code. Look at this long amount of commands that they're doing for you in a very, very short period of time. There is over 2,000 lines of code here. So uh, very thankful for Carlos and for all of these people that put these scripts together and make our lives a lot easier when it comes to hunting and escalation on these machines. So that's it. That is the brief rundown of the automated tools. From here, we're going to start working on actual exploitation escalation. And we're going to start with kernel exploits first. So I'll catch you over in the next video as we discuss kernel exploitation. All right, we've made it to our first exploitation section, and I know I'm excited, so I hope you're excited as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about are called kernel exploits. And before we can exploit kernels, we need to talk about what a kernel is. And you can see here, I've got this lovely picture, which I have sourced from Wikipedia. There's no shame in that. And you can see that the kernel lives here in the middle of the applications and the hardware. You got your CPU, your memory, your devices. And really, what is a kernel? A kernel is just a computer program that controls everything in the system. And what it's doing is it's facilitating the interactions here between these hardware components and software components. So you could basically think of a kernel as a translator. What it is doing is just converting these input output requests or IO requests into instruction sets. Okay, so it is sitting here in between the applications or the software and the hardware components. Now, what is so important about a kernel? Well, when it comes to exploitation, kernel exploits are something that we look for, especially when we're trying to do any sort of privilege escalation. If you took the Windows course, we talked about Windows-based kernel exploits. Guess what? There are Linux-based kernel exploits as well. Now, these are very complicated in terms of developing, finding, and exploiting, but thankfully there are researchers that put these together for us and identify it so it can make it a lot easier on us. From our standpoint, all we have to do is identify the operating system or the version that we're on and see or try to identify if there are any known kernel exploits. We're not sitting here trying to write kernel exploits by any means because that would be incredibly difficult, but identifying them and running exploit against them, pretty straightforward. So what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we're going to do the uname a like you saw us do in Linux and try to see if we can identify a vulnerable version of a kernel. So let's go ahead and take a look at one more thing really quick. So if we take a look here, there is a GitHub called kernel exploits. I'm going to share this in the resources. You can kind of just take a look at the amount of kernel exploits there are. And this is by far not even close to them. I actually see some that I know for a fact are missing. Uh, but common ones are called dirty cow, which is not in here. Uh, the full Nelson, half Nelson are, are big ones as well. This memo dipper is one, ptrace, kmod. Uh, there's quite a few in here that I see right off the top of my, my head that are just very, very familiar to me. But you'll learn how to identify these. You can come into resources like this, or as you're going to see here shortly, you can literally just Google. But what we're looking for is something just like this, like, hey, Ubuntu 12.0.4.0, uh, running 3.2.0-23 that has a kernel vulnerability. So we're going to see what our version is vulnerable to here to here in a second and move on. So I'll catch you in the next video as we actually escalate via a kernel exploit.
All right, let's identify the exploit we are after and how we are going to exploit it. So we kind of covered the manual method. If we do a uname-a here, you can see that we have this Linux Debian 2.6.32. I like to copy this whole thing and just kind of fire it into Google. We could also use like search exploit against this and see if we can find anything. But if we come over here and we just go to Google and see what sticks. Just do exploit and see if anything comes up. And we see, okay, we're seeing something on Linux kernel 2.6.32. Let's copy or open this in a new one. Then we see one here. And let's see what shows up. We got a 2013 and a 2016 on this. Now we've got a dev PTMX keystroke timing local disclosure. Um, that's not telling us for sure that we're doing any sort of escalation. It looks like this is just determining the password length of a local user who runs SU. That's not really what we want. So let's close that out. Ah, race condition privilege escalation Etsy password method. OK, so we've got uh, something called Dirty Cow, which is claiming to do a race condition privilege escalation for us. So that's interesting. This would be something that I would want to look deeper into. And it says on here, hey, Linux kernel version 2.6.22 to 3.9. That's a pretty wide gap, if you ask me. If we come back. We're on 2.6.32, which seems to meet that criteria as to fitting in between this gap here. So indicators early on point to Dirty Cow as being a potential exploit. So we can come read through here and see what it does. It says this exploit is used to modify user values according to your needs. The default is Firefart. Uh, it tells us, hey, when you download this, you're going to compile this and then you're going to execute it and you can execute it or execute with a new password and then you can switch user if you need to. Uh, there are various versions of Dirty Cow. Dirty Cow is a very, very, very well known exploit and this is one that if you're just getting into privilege escalation that I guarantee you you're going to see again at least once. Uh, so let's take a look at another method. So if we CD into our tools, and we do an LS. We can see that we have the Linux exploit suggester in here. We could utilize that as well. So we could say something like CD into Linux exploit suggester. And we've run this before, but we'll run it again really quick and just let that fire off. If we scroll through here, Dirty Cow should show up. And look, it does. So it definitely identifies Dirty Cow. And you can see that it's tagging it based on the version that we're running. Um, so I would come look through here as well. It's not like as clear cut, unfortunately. I mean, there's a lot of exploits. If we're just scrolling through here, that says, hey, you've got all these exploits available to you. Um, I, I wish it was more, hey, like you should really, really look here first, but it is identified here. So something to think about. And of course, there's other tools that you can run to see if it identifies it as well. But moving on to the exploit itself. Uh, we've already got the tools folder here. So if we actually LS, you could see that there's a dirty cow folder. So you don't have to go download anything. Everything is put together for you. So let's go ahead and just CD into this dirty cow folder. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to just LS. You can see there is a cow.c in here. So we're just going to compile this with GCC. We're going to say, hey, let's compile. We're going to do a dash p thread here. And then we're just going to say cow.c and we'll just make this output whatever we want. We could just call it cow and should compile. If we ls, you can see now cow is sitting in here compiled. Let's do a quick ID. If I could type ID, you can see we're the user TCM. OK, let's go ahead and try executing the exploit and see what happens. So let's do a dot forward slash cow. Let that run. And now this will take just a second. Uh, so go ahead and if you need to pause the video, go ahead and pause and then come back once you have a, your uh, next screen or your command prompt back. All right, so it still says we are TCM. What gives? Well, if you see here, it says, hey, we're backing up user bin password to temp back. Well, what if we type in password now? 
Ah, yes. So we've taken advantage of this. It's actually overwritten this PSSWD or password. And when we execute the password command, it elevates us to root. So now we are the root user. So we have successfully elevated this machine. And that's it. This is really, kernel exploits are very straightforward, again, from the pen tester perspective or the CTF perspective in the sense that we hunt down what kernel version we're running and we try to identify and see if there are any exploits available to us based on that kernel version. So we can do it from a Google method, which I kind of prefer because it's just quick and easy, or we can actually use, utilize tools and you see the tools did identify that this was actually vulnerable as well. So that's it for kernel exploits. In the next section, we're gonna talk about passwords and file permissions and see what can be left behind on a machine that could be used maliciously by us. So I'll catch you over in the next video. Welcome to the passwords and file permissions section. So in this section, we're going to look at a few different escalation paths. We're going to look at stored passwords, which we've already kind of hunted in the earlier enumeration section. We're going to look for weak file permissions, and we're also going to look for SSH keys. And I will show you once we access those or once we hunt those, how we can abuse those to gain escalation into the machine. So we won't spend too much time on this. Just a quick overview. Let's go ahead and dive right into stored passwords. So the first topic we're gonna to look at is stored passwords. And like I mentioned in a previous video, one of the first commands I like to run when I get onto a machine is the history command. Now, if we have access to the history command and we can review history, it's great. We could type in history and see history here. We could scroll through. We actually do have a password here. You could see somebody try to connect to MySQL with uh, user and password. Uh, another thing too, before we get into that, is that you can cat out the bash history here. So if you do it actually ls-la, you could see that hiding here is your bash history. So if we come here, we just do a cat bash history, you could attempt to see the bash history too. Now it's not as pretty as the other one. However, it still works. So let's type in history again. I'm just gonna show you what we got going on here. So if we scroll all the way up again, reading through this, we could see that there was a username and password in here. So we've got root and password one, two, three. And you can see all the users actions, what they were up to. You could see that uh, the directory like Linux exploit suggester was made and uh, changes to a files were made and even some of the earlier hunting that we have done. But here we can look for sensitive items. And I have seen all kinds of crazy things in the history from passwords to locations of sensitive items or even just little tips that content creators leave behind just for you to kind of get an idea. Now, it's a very easy win, doesn't always happen, but it's something that you should be looking for. So to prove point on escalation, at least point one here, we can do a uh, switch user of root and just type in password one, two, three, and we are now root. So that was a password found in a file. Now, I've showed you the color hunting way where we had the red and it kind of highlighted the password and everything else. That little tip and trick came from payloads, all the things. If we actually scroll through here on payloads, all the things, and we come down to looting for passwords, just click on this. There's a second command. So here's that first command where we were hunting the passwords and we had color, it was all pretty. This find command works really well too for the directory that you're in. So if we wanna take a quick peek and see what we can have in front of us, if we say we just wanna search in this folder right here, we're in our home folder, let me just clear the screen. And I just wanna paste this in and search for the word password for anything here in our home folder. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and just execute that and it works really fast. Now, the if you scroll through, it's gonna be mostly WinPs all the way up to the top. It's gonna to be most of our scripting. But if we come down looking towards the bottom, 
you can actually see, well, the very, very bottom, look, it pulls batch history. It pulls that same MySQL command out where we see the root and password. But we also see this IRSSI config, and it says, hey, message Nick serve that we are going to identify, and we are using password 321. Now, this box, of course, is built off of a lab that was pre-existing. This lab was modified by myself, and the original password of the lab was password 321. So if we were hunting for passwords or anything here, you could see that this was actually stored in a file here sitting inside of a hidden file, this IRSSI config file, in our directory. Now, that's one way of hunting for things as well. The other thing that you might have to do, and this is, this can get really comprehensive. Remember, we utilized, um, we're utilizing manual commands, but we can also utilize things like linpeas to hunt or even Linux suggester if we ls um, and cd into tools and ls again. Actually, lin and num or linpeas are really great at this. Uh, the exploit suggester is not the one that we want to run, but we can run the, let's go ahead and go to CD linpeas, and we can run linpeas here. And this might take a second, and while we're doing this, I'm going to talk through some other stuff too. So run through linpeas, and let's see if it pulls down anything. I actually don't know if it's going to or not. But what we're trying to do here is automate the hunting process because it's going to do some hunting for us. And you can see it's looking for a password here. Uh, but we really want to hunt the hunt the passwords, and if this can do something a lot quicker for us than we can do, I'm all for it. Uh, the other thing we might want to look into is doing manual review, so understanding the file system and seeing what's there when we're hunting these passwords and trying to elevate that way, and we'll cover that in just a second. But we can scroll through here, and you can see that it's searching for pass W of any sort, so it's looking for uh, either pass WD or password, and it's looking to see if they can find this anywhere and there's any sort of configuration. Uh, so you can hunt through this and look and just see if there's anything in here that would indicate that there's a password. You found the MySQL password here. Uh, so it's definitely highlighting out you know, important items that you might wanna look for. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but automating this process is a great way to do this too. So. Don't be afraid of tool automation, just kind of, again, like we talked about in the beginning, understand what it's doing and why it's doing it. Now, the last thing I wanna show you is if we go back to our home folder and we ls, we need to look around at what's in front of us sometimes. It's not always clear cut, searching for a file, hunting down that configuration. Sometimes it's right in front of our faces. So here we've got this myvpn.ovpn. It's an open VPN file. So if we cat the myvpn file and we take a look, quick peek, you can see that there's an auth user pass here for this file. Now, if we come into here and we cat this out, you can see that the user of user and password 321 are actually stored in this file. So we have credentials for this user. Again, we had a user that used to exist of password 321. That user doesn't exist anymore. However, we still have them left behind in memory. So we have identifying items here that show, hey, passwords are stored in files. We can find them. And they're not hiding too terribly. And another thing that I could show you too is just some more command line kung fu is if you want to take this further. So say you just want to do quick searches. Maybe you do history, and instead of looking through the entire history, you could just grep on pass. And then look, we just pull down immediately password. I don't know if I recommend doing that per se, unless you're just doing like a quick and dirty script like this. However, I like to read through the entire history when I'm going through it, because you might see more than just passwords. You might see configurations and sensitive files and stuff. But for, for that's it, really, for the most part, when it comes to password hunting, Again, I recommend utilizing scripting for this. It's going to be really difficult to kind of hunt it down, but also don't be afraid to enumerate and look at what's in front of you because scripts are going to pull down on certain keywords like pass or password, but maybe there's a word in there that's just not pulling down on, or maybe there's an authorized key or some specific configuration to what's in front of you. And there may be that you have to run something like a PS aux on this and see what services are running and maybe 
some services running like Apache, for example, that has uh, credentials hidden inside of the web server. So you don't know where you're gonna have to look. You have to just kind of do that enumeration process, feel what's around you, and then start hunting the passwords. But this is kind of to give you a basic indicator on what you're looking for and how you can utilize your tools to actually discover some of these passwords. So that's it for this video. In the next video, we're gonna cover weak file permissions and what we can do to abuse them. All right, on to weak file permissions. So when we're looking for weak file permissions, what we're looking for is do we have access to a file that we shouldn't, or do we have executable or write access to a file we shouldn't? Can we modify something? Can we do anything malicious with files that we shouldn't be able to access as a user? So in this example, we're going to look at the Etsy password and Etsy shadow files and see how we can compromise the machine with access to those. So let's first go ahead and look at the file permissions. So I'm going to do an ls-la and just look at the Etsy password. And then I'm also going to do an ls-la and look at the Etsy shadow. Now, as a regular user, you should have read access to the Etsy password. This looks appropriate to me. So you can see we have read, read, read. So we have read access here. Now, if we look at the Etsy shadow, we should not have any read access whatsoever. The read write or the read access should be on the root and root only, uh, but here or the people that have the ability to access that file, such as administrators. But here, we could see that we have read access as a regular non-admin user on this machine. So what does that mean? Well, we can access the shadow file. And let's talk about more about what the password and shadow files are and why they're important. So first, let's cat out the Etsy password. Now, Etsy password, I mean, it's called password. It does not contain any passwords. This is why it's readable. It's world readable to all users. This just allows us to identify what users are here on the machine. And we kind of talked about this already. We can see the user, we can see the groups, uh, the ID, etc. that this these users are a part of. Well, why is it called the password file? Back in the day, this used to actually store passwords in the password file. Now that's stored in the shadow file. All we get here is this wonderful little placeholder of an X. So this X is holding your password from your shadow file. If we actually cut out the shadow file, I can prove a little bit of point. And then once we get a little bit more malicious with this, you'll see what I mean as well. But you can see here in the shadow file that we have this long hash. Okay, and we'll talk about identifying this hash here in, in a second, but we have this hash. Now, if we were to plug this hash here in for this X, that would fill in the blank. We would know here as this placeholder that, okay, that goes into here and that is this user when they go in and try to log in with their password. Uh, if it ties to this hash, they get su successfully logged in. Now, we can do a few malicious things. Unfortunately, we don't have any read write access. So I'm just gonna talk theory behind this and still tell you how we can escalate this machine. Now, if we were able to modify the Etsy password, we could delete this X out of here. If there's no placeholder, then we don't have a password and we could just pseudo switch user into root. Or we could switch user into root and we'd be fine. We'd log in as root. On the other hand, we can get rid of the password or hash to a different password where we know what the hash is. And then we would be able to log in as root. We could also modify uh, the groups of our user. So say we have this group of 1000, we could change this or we could change our ID to zero, for example, and just become the root user. There's a lot of different things that we could do if we can modify. Here we can't modify, but not saying that you won't be able to see that at some point. I guarantee some point you're gonna see an, an ability to modify a password or shadow files. So always keep your wheels spinning on what your file permissions are. Here we are limited in our file permissions, but we do have read access to the shadow file, which is a big, big no-no. So this will get identified if you run this through any of the scripting 
that's our scripts that are in our tools. So Lynn Pease will pick this up very easily. Uh, I'm not going to show you that this time around. I'm just going to tell you it's going to get identified. And if we come into here, we can see we have a couple of different hashes. We've got our hash as TCM user, and we've got the root hash. So how can we take advantage of this? Well, there are some tools that we can utilize. So what I like to do is I like to copy out the Etsy password here first. So if you cat the Etsy password and just copy the contents, I'm going to go put this onto my machine. So I'm just going to make a new tab, make this a little bit bigger, and then I'm just going to g-edit whatever your favorite tool is and just say password. You can use Nano or Vim or Vi if you're crazy. Um, and then we can just paste that in there and come through, grab the shadow file, copy all of its contents, copy that, and then I'm going to come back into this other one and just g-edit. I'm going to call this shadow. I'm going to paste this, delete that extra line I copied, save this. And then now we can utilize a tool called unshadow. So if I type in unshadow, this is built into Kali. You can see, hey, I want the password file and I want the shadow file. So we could just say unshadow password shadow. And look what this is going to do. It's going to come through here and you see that placeholder. Remember the X where the X used to be? Well, guess what? It's putting that hash in there. And it's kind of just filling in that blank with that hash. And this is what is called an unshadowed file. So let's go ahead and copy this, all this detail here. And I'm going to just do a g-edit and I'll call this unshadowed, although I'm not going to save this. So I'm just doing this to quickly copy and paste. So I'm going to delete all these out. All I want are the users with hashes. And I realize this is very small. So if you can't see this, I'm sorry. But all I've done is deleted anything that didn't have a hash. So you should have a root and a TCM user at this point. And then all you're going to do from here is you're going to just copy these. So I'm copying these. Now, I'm just going to demonstrate. You can absolutely do this, save this file, and run this in your Linux. I'm going to run this through Hashcat on my Windows system just to show you. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of cover that out. So I'm saving this to a file on my a Windows system. We also need to identify the hashing type. So if we go to Google and we say Hashcat hash types, it's a good one to put in. And you should get this example hashes here on hashcat.net. So I'm going to go ahead and just click on that. And if you come through here, it's got all the different modes that we can run for hashing. Now, what I like to do is I like to just look at the hash. And the hash is, starts with dollar sign six dollar sign. So if I do a control F and I do dollar sign six dollar sign, immediately it pulls up SHA-512 or SHA-512 crypt. And you can see an example hash here. And it says, hey, we've got 1800 on the mode here. So what we're going to do, and through the power of video editing, I just want to save a little bit of time. I'm going to share with you my already used Hashcat output, just because it's a little slow to actually uh, do a SHA-512. Even with RockU, this took, it took a minute with RockU, which most hashes take me a few seconds, and I'm running on a 2080 Ti, just for perspective. So if I scroll up just a little bit, I took those two passwords and I just put them through Hashcat here. So I did Hashcat64.exe because I'm running this on Windows. I'm utilizing my GPU as opposed to utilizing the CPU of the VM I'm running. I did a mode of 1800, which we identified. I have my creds.txt, rocky.txt, and then I'm optimizing this with a dash capital O. Now this scrolled through, we came in here and we cracked one of the hashes. This dollar sign, six dollar sign, TV forward slash, we'll go look it up, is password one, two, three. And you can see that we only cracked one out of two hashes. So we know we cracked the root hash because we know TCM's password is hacker one, two, three. Now, obviously, hacker one, two, three apparently is not in the rock you list. That's OK. If you use any other word list, you would probably find it pretty easily. Uh, however, we actually didn't crack it with Rocky, which I was surprised to see. So from there, we could easily just take the password that we uncovered of this user and elevate our privileges with the switch user to root again of password one, two, three. 
And here we are, we are now the root user based on the data that we saw in the shadow file. So this boils down to, again, permissions that are excessive. So it's always important to look for these things and just see where we have access to. Again, the quick wins are looking at the history, looking at sudo, and then starting to look at file permissions and just see. Now, these are things that I would use, again, identified with a script. It's just a lot easier to look at your script, roll through, and see what's there. But this one would absolutely light up like a Christmas tree or whatever tree um, here on a script. So just keep in mind, just start thinking about these things. What files should I be looking for? I've actually had this question come up in interviews before in terms of, hey, what sensitive files would you look for on a, a, on a Linux system? So keep your wheels spinning. But this is just one example of how we can utilize weak file permissions to elevate to root on a machine. So that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to cover quickly how to hunt SSH keys and abuse that functionality. All right, last video in this section, let's talk about hunting for SSH keys. Now, we're going to utilize the Payloads All the Things website. If you go back here, under the looting for passwords section, if we scroll down just a little bit, there is this SSH key sensitive files. And you can see that we're either going to be looking for perhaps authorized keys or an ID RSA. So let's hunt for both of these really quick. And then we're going to talk about what these are. So I'm just going to copy and paste these commands in and see, OK, are there any authorized keys on this machine? Not that we can access at least. And what about the other one? Let's go ahead and check for the ID RSA. I'm going to go ahead and paste that. And OK, we do find a backups super secret keys ID RSA. But before we get into that and how to abuse this, what are authorized keys? What's an ID RSA? Well, with SSH, we can do something like SSH, not sh, SSH keygen. And that is something that we can uh, run and generate some keys. Now, these keys are what is called a key pair. We get a public key and a private key. Now, the public key would be copied to an SSH server. And we'll leave that key on that server. And that's how it knows how to identify us as who we are. We also have what is called an authorized key or a private key. Uh, actually, the authorized key, sorry, would be stored. The public key would be stored in the authorized key folder. Uh, the private key on our end is something that we keep. So the user keeps the private key. The authorized keys are stored in the authorized key folder. So what we're checking to see is, there, are there any authorized keys? Who has SSH access? What can we find about this? Do we have anything called an ID RSA on our side? So what we're looking for is ID RSA which is a private key. That's our private key. Now, if we're looking through files and we see, well, there's a backup of an ID RSA, uh, maybe that backup is utilized somewhere. So if we go and just look at this, let's just cat out the backups super secret key ID RSA. And it really doesn't tell us too much. It just says, hey, open SSH private key. And then you see the private key information. So we don't have a lot. Well, if we don't know where it goes, we can just kind of shoot a shot in the dark here with this. This could easily go to another server. We don't know where it goes, but we have discovered a key. And this key will allow us SSH access to a machine. So what we can do is we can open up on our end a new window. And I'm just going to call this, I'm going to gedit. I'm going to call this ID RSA, which I may already have in here. I do. Might be the same one. It's not. Let's go ahead and save this. And what we'll do is we're going to SSH into this server as root and see if we can get access to it. So let's go ahead. I'm going to control C out of here because I have, or exit out of here. I have forgotten the IP. It's 4.67 on my end. So, OK, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to do SSH dash I. Actually, I'm not. We're going to CH mod. We're going to change the mode to 600, I do believe, on IDRSA. We'll see if I'm correct. 
And then we're going to SSH to root or dash I ID RSA. So we're going to use the uh, private key that we have generated here. And then we're going to try root at 192.168.467. And there you go. We are now logged in as root. So we're utilizing, instead of having to use a password, we're utilizing a private key. Now somewhere in this root folder, if we lsla, we can see there's a .ssh folder. We can cd to .ssh, we lsla here. You can see there's an authorized keys folder. So in the authorized keys folder, we know that, or actually there's authorized keys, sorry. In the authorized key file, it's cat authorized keys, uh, you can see that there is a root at Kali. This is me. I generated this key, and this is how I have access. Uh, but you can utilize that same key pair. It's looking for that key pair. So this is the public key, and then we're looking for the private key, which we have access to, and that's how we are able to gain access to this machine. So hopefully the public private key pairs make sense. We are just hunting for anything when we're looking on these machines. We're just hunting for a quick win. And this is, again, another quick win. We don't know where it goes. We have to just try it out, see. But this is very, very common from a um, CTF standpoint when it comes to just looking for, for keys like this and even a pen test standpoint. If you end up on a Linux machine and you want to see if you have any sort of uh, IDRSA or any sort of keys that can access you or leverage you to pivot to another area in the network, it's always worth looking for. So that is it for this section. We're going to move on to one of my favorite types of escalation, which are pseudo uh, privilege escalation techniques, and we've got a bunch to cover. So I will see you in the next section when we cover pseudo. Welcome to the escalation path section of pseudo. Now, pseudo is probably my favorite escalation path, and I'm really excited to teach it. Uh, and really quickly, what is pseudo? In case we don't know what pseudo is, well, it is, according to the man page, something that allows a system administrator to delegate authority to give certain users or groups of users the ability to run some or all commands as root. Basically, it allows us to run a command as root and we're going to see how we can abuse that functionality in this section. Now, we've got five different ways that we're going to abuse that. We're going to do pseudo shell escaping. We're going to look at intended functionality. We're going to look at LD preloads. And then we've got a couple of new 2019 CVEs that I want to share with you and uh, are pretty exciting as well. So all in all, we're going to start getting into actual box exploitation. We're going to have three boxes in this section that we're going to try to compromise, and then we're going to try to escalate. So we're going to start to get hands-on practice now moving forward through each section in this course. So let's go ahead and dive right in. We're going to start talking about pseudo shell escaping. So I'll see you over in the next video. All right, first up are pseudo shell escapes. So if we do a sudo dash L on our machine, we go sudo dash L. We can see that we have the option here for quite a bit of things. If we're looking with root no password, we can run quite a few things here as root. Now, if I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, I can run something as root. I don't have to provide a root password. How can I abuse this to escalate to root? So we could do what's called shell escaping. I'm going to actually show you a great resource. Uh, so if we go to Google and we go GTFO bins, I'll leave it to your interpretation to what that means. But GTFO bins, and you open this in a new tab, you can search amongst binaries. So let's take a look at one of them that we have. Uh, we have access to, well, Vim is a good one. Let's take a look at Vim. So let's go back and we're going to go here and go to Vim. We'll search that. OK, and let's click into Vim here on the binary. And it says, OK, if you have a shell, it can be used to break out from restricted environments by spawning an interactive system shell. That's great. 
We can get a reverse shell with them. We can get a non-interactive reverse shell, bind shell. We can do file uploads, file downloads, file write, read, SUID, ah, yes, sudo. So I want you to be aware of all the things that you're seeing here. This GTFO bins, this is an amazing, amazing resource. This is something that I utilize all the time when I'm trying to take advantage of privilege escalation, especially when it's related to sudo, or I see some sort of item or binary that's running that I have no idea what it's doing. So this could be from a shell functionality like you saw. It could be, hey, I want to get a reverse shell using that tool. Can I do that? Or maybe there's SUID, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll probably come back to GTFO bins for that. Uh, there's a lot of things here that we can utilize. And right at the top, all we have to do is click sudo, and it says, hey, we can maybe do a shell escape sequence here with sudo. So let's go ahead and try. We could just do sudo uh, vim, and then we can try this command right here. So this is going to use sudo. It's going to say, hey, we're going to utilize vim, and then we're going to issue uh, this bin sh and hopefully get a shell as the root user. So let's go ahead and paste that and see what happens. Okay, we've got an sh shell. It's not bash, but it's sh. We can do who am I? And we are now root on this. So we just utilize that sudo easily to switch over to uh, and over to switch to root. So that's an example of a shell escape sequence. Now there are quite a few that we can do. Let's see if we can exit here. And okay, let's. Uh, oh, we're still in. We're still in Vim. Let's do a quit. Okay, now we're back into TCM here. So if you didn't catch that, I typed exit enter, and then if you do a Q like that, you can quit out of Vim. Uh, okay, so we have other ones that we can do. So let's take a look at one of those. What about awk awk? This one's interesting, right? Let's see if we have a escape sequence for this. So if we go back to GTFO bins and we let's just go back one or two, we type in awk. OK, and then from here, I'm just going to go right into, hey, I've got pseudo privileges. What can I do with pseudo privileges? And then we could do this pseudo awk begin system bin sh. Let's go into here. I'm going to go ahead and paste this. And then I'm just going to make this bin bash this time around. Hit enter. And look who we are. We are no other than root. So because we have pseudo privileges, because we have access to this binary, some of these binaries have functionalities that allow us to escape. And we can get into a root user just by doing this. Now, this is awesome. GTFO bins is one of the best resources out there. Now, I'm going to show you one other resource as well. So I'm going to provide the GTFO bins, and I'm going to provide this resource, which is Try Hack Me. And this Try Hack Me box that I'm going to show you here is completely free. So you can see it's a free room. And this box is called Linux Privesk Playground. So if you go to room slash Privesk Playground, I'm going to link this in the resources as well. You can come in here, and this box has 80 SUID and pseudo Privesks. It says likely many more. OK, we haven't gotten to SUID yet, but I want you to take note of this because this is a great way to practice. And if you're ever curious, you can go into the write ups and you can start opening some of these up and you can see, OK, somebody did an escalation via Vim. So obviously there's a, a Vim one in there, but you can come through here and see, OK, what type of escalations are in here and what are people doing? So somebody's doing a write up for all the SUIDs right here. Here's some for sudo and all the shell escapes. If you actually look, it's kind of hard to see, but if we make this really big, you could see the sudo l entry with no password. There are all kinds of no password entries. So if you want somewhere to come and practice these, this one is a great one to come practice and just understand what you're looking at and getting just experience to different types of binaries and how to exploit them. So again, your best friend in these situations, especially with sudo, is GTFO bins. So the, if I see a sudo L and I see something in here, I'm coming right to GTFO bins and just pulling this down. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, from here, what we're going to do, and if you want to practice, by the way, before I move on to the next video, if you want to practice, I encourage you to come through and see if you can exploit any of these other ones and gain access with that. So I'm only showing you two, but there's plenty in here to do uh, and, and gain access to 
abuse functionality and gain root on these machines. So from here, we're going to move on and we're going to quickly look at intended functionality of sudo and see how we can escalate via that. So I'll catch you over in the next video. All right, now let's talk about exploiting sudo with intended functionality. So let's talk about this from a different perspective. If we do a sudo dash l, let's pretend that we are a or an administrator. We're a website administrator. And we need access to this Apache 2. It's part of our job to utilize Apache 2 to maintain the website, do whatever we need to do. Now, if we were to go to GTFO bins and we come in here and we type Apache, well, we can look right here. It's not in here. But maybe there's some sort of intended functionality in Apache 2 that we can issue or run as and gain access to something. So what if I go to Google and in Google I say, OK, I know I've got Apache. I know I have sudo. And I could say privilege escalation. We could even do Apache 2. That's fine. And the first thing that comes up says abusing sudo Linux privilege escalation. So we come in here and it looks like it's a little guide. They've got a bunch of different ones. So maybe we'll just copy and we'll do a control F and find this. And I'm going to make this website a little bigger so that we can see it. Uh, and then we could see if we scroll down here, it says using Apache command. Sadly, you can't get shell and can't edit system files, but you can view system files. OK, so there's an intended functionality of Apache that will allow us to view system files. And I have seen this in other places. Let's take a look. So it says, hey, why don't we run sudo and try to view the Etsy shadow file? OK, we know we can view the shadow file, but let's pretend that we couldn't view this shadow file otherwise. Let's go ahead and just paste this. And you can see that we can view the shadow file here. We see the root right here. So we're seeing the root of, or we're seeing the, the hash here for, for root on the shadow file. So we're able to abuse this. Now, I've seen some very, very creative uses of intended functionality. One of the best ones that I've seen was utilizing wget to do something very similar. And let me show you that really quick. This is from a write-up that I did a while ago. But I kind of want to share this with you, and I'll share it as something that you can look at on intended functionality. This is a hack the box machine called Sunday. And you can tell my love for Borat here. Um, but if you come down, once we get into the actual escalation part, and we come in where the user, we run sudo l, and you can see that we have a user bin wget. And OK, well, maybe this user was given the privileges to run wget because they needed to download files or they needed to grab files from a web server, et cetera. But if you do some digging on wget, there is functionality of it that allows us to exploit this machine. If we scroll down just a little bit, you can see that I ran a sudo wget and then there was a post file command that allows me to select a file, which, of course, I picked Etsy shadow and I transferred it to myself. I was listening here over on Netcat and I transferred it and look what I did. I grabbed the root hash. Similar to what we did with Apache 2 here, it's intended functionality of this specific binary, but we were able to abuse it in a way where we could transfer a file or gain some sort of escalation. So I'll share this with you as well in terms of the article, but just be thinking, just because there's nothing, if we do a sudo dash L and there's, you come to, GTFO bins and there's just no sort of escape or any way to abuse that doesn't mean there's not a way around or there's not something that we can do to utilize that feature still to gain access and escalate the machine. So always be thinking about outside the box. Definitely work on your Google skills and make sure that you can search some of these things and try to hunt these down. They're not always as obvious. I remember when I was doing this wget I read through the man pages of wget until I understood the complete functionality because my initial thought was wget, you can only get things, right? That's the whole functionality of wget, but that's not true. There's a way to actually export as well. So very, very cool feature and took a lot of research, but that's sometimes what it takes. And that's why I wanted to show you this example. So that's it for this one. We're going to go ahead and move on to the LD preload. 
and see why that is vulnerable. So I'll see you over in the next video. Now on to escalation attacks via LD preload. This is going to be a somewhat complex topic, but we're going to introduce it at a high level. And what I want you to take away from this is how to identify the vulnerability and how to exploit the vulnerability. There is going to be descriptions of everything and you might not understand all of it and there's going to be C code and you might not know C and that's absolutely fine. I'm going to do my best to walk you through it. If you find that you should need more information, feel free to go look for more information as well. But again, very high level, you just need to understand why we're identifying the vulnerability and how to exploit it. So let's go ahead and do a sudo dash L. And here you could see that we have this environment variable or it says LD underscore preload. Okay, and what is LD preload? Well, it's also known as preloading. So preloading is a feature of the LD, if you've ever seen LD, which is the dynamic linker. And that's available on most Unix systems. So what we're doing is we're going to be preloading a library, user-specific shared library, before any other shared libraries are loaded. Meaning we're going to run sudo here with this LD preload and we're going to run it on any command that we want, but we're going to be able to execute our own library and preload that before we run anything else. So remember, we're loading before all other libraries. OK, so we're going to make a malicious uh, library in order to do that. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a file. We'll just use nano. We'll say nano and we'll just call this shell dot C. OK. OK, so we're going to write this in C and we're just going to write it like this. We're going to say include and we're going to include the standard input output. We're going to include the sys types. Dot H. We're also going to include standard libraries. All right, now that we've got those set up, we're going to go ahead and just do a void in it right here. And we're going to declare a few things. So let's talk about what we're declaring. So first things first, I'm just doing four spaces for these unset environment. And we're going to do LD underscore preload. And then once we do that, what we're going to do here is we're going to set a GID of zero. And we're going to also and I missed the I missed something up here. This is important. Our code would not have ran without that. Uh, set GID of zero, set UID of zero. And what do we think those indicate? I'll let you think about it here for a second. We'll cover the code here once it's all typed out. And then we're going to do a system bin bash. Then we're going to close this off. All right, let's think about this code here. So up at the top, we are including our standard IO, our standard libraries, and our sys types. And then we're coming down here, and we're just saying, hey, I want to unset an environment variable, which is just this LD preload. And then I'm going to go ahead and set GID, or group ID of 0, UID, or user ID of 0, who is zero in our system, that's root. And then I want system to execute bin bash when I do this. So we are doing this all through the preload feature. So we're going to preload this SO is how we're going to export this as an SO. We're going to preload the SO and then we're going to execute it. So let's go ahead and control X and we'll save this with a Y, hit enter. And then we just need to go ahead and GCC this. So we're going to compile this with GCC. We're going to do FPIC right here, which I actually had to look this one up. This is uh, means position independent code. That means regardless of where your shell addressing is, this is going to uh, function. So we're also going to need a dash shared. And then we're going to take our output. We'll just call this shell.so. 
and we need our file that we're compiling, which is shell.c. And lastly, we're just going to say no start file. OK, and then we're going to hit Enter. Now that that's compiled, what we can do here is we can do an ls. You can see the shell.so is here. So all we need to do now is run sudo ld preload. And then we just use our shell.so here. And then all we have to do is we just have to say some something we can run as root. So it could be like Apache 2, awk, vim. It doesn't really matter. Anything that we can run as sudo here. So we just select Apache 2, hit Enter. Ah, I have messed up. OK, so shell.so, that's accurate, but we need to call the full path. So let's call this out as home user or wherever you put this file, shell.so. Now let's try that again. Aha, and now we are root. OK, so we took that file, remember, we in our C file, we said, hey, I want to become root. I want to execute bin bash. And once we did this, it took this preload. It executed this first. And then we are now root because we executed that first. So this LD preload, being able to preload a library, it's bad news bears, all right? And that's really what I want you to know. I want you to know more so than anything else that if you run a sudo dash L and you see LD preload, your little spidey senses should be going off. And then how you can generate this very, very basic code. You don't have to remember it. You don't have to understand the full functionality, though it helps. But you just have to say, hey, LD preload. I remember seeing that. I'm going to go look up how to priv s that. You can copy a code that's out there already, compile it, and then you are good to go. So that is it for this video. From here, we're going to put you to a test now and see how well you have been following along. We're going to do a challenge machine here coming up, and then we'll continue on with more pseudo lessons. So I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to your first challenge machine. So all the machines we're going to do in this course are on Try Hack Me. And now that we've played around with pseudo a little bit, I want to see where you're at in skill set. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to tryhackme.com and you can go ahead and click on Hacktivities. And in here, we're going to specifically search for simple CTF. So if you start typing in simple, you could see beginner level CTF. And we're going to start easy. We're going to see how you fared so far. So what we're going to do is I just want you to go ahead and join this room. So once you're logged in, click on join room and then go ahead and deploy this machine. Once you deploy, you can go through if you want and answer all these questions. But your main goal here is to one, get access to the machine at a low level and then two, root the machine completely. So once you're done with that, go ahead and move on to the next video. We'll cover a walkthrough. I'll cover my methodology and we'll move on with that. If at any point you get stuck, you can watch the video. There are also plenty of write ups here for this machine. So if you're curious to see uh, how other people did it, you could also look at the write ups and go from there. So I will catch you over in the next video as we walk through this machine. All right, let's walk through this machine, shall we? So I deployed the machine. I am at 10.10.149.152 while well, I'm attacking this. And I can see that port 21 for FTP has come back. We have anonymous login. I also see port 80 for Apache. And then I see port 2222, which is actually running SSH. Now, we should do our standard checks across the board, make sure that there are no exploits for any of these the VS FTPD, the Apache, or the open SSH. Assuming we did those checks and moved on, then we can continue on without any exploits of being available there. I would always go check the FTP first. So let me go ahead. I'm going to copy this so that way I don't have to keep doing. Oh, they have a nice little copy feature. That's new. OK, I'm going to go ahead and just paste this here. And then we're going to try to FTP anonymously and see what's available in this folder. So we'll do anonymous. And then let's do LS. And they've got an FTP folder, it looks like. Let's see the FTP. 
failed to change directory. Uh, looks like we're not able to do anything in here. Maybe we can put files, but if we don't have a way to execute, then this probably isn't the best path to go, which leads me to believe maybe that we start looking at the web path for now because port 2222, that's great SSH, but if there's no vulnerability here, and unless there's a weak password or something in use, then it's likely that we're gonna have to attack the web server and just go that route. And I can see that there is an open EMR 5013 in the robots.txt. So that could be something that we explore. Let's go ahead and just go out to the web. And you can see it is just an Apache default page. Now, when we try to go out to this file here, this, uh, this directory, you're gonna see that it doesn't have anything associated with it. So let's go ahead and try it. And it's actually not found. So we don't have any any indication here. We're seeing that we're running on 2.4.18. We're going against an Ubuntu machine. But other than that, we really don't have any indicator. So I'm going to dive into the toolkit instead, and I'm going to go ahead and try to do some directory busting. Now, depending on which tool you like to use here, that's absolutely fine. A Durbuster works fine. Derb, any of those will work. GoBuster, I'm going to use Dir Search, which I am becoming more and more fond of. So I'm going to go ahead and CD over to Opt. And once I run this, I'll show you where to, you can get this from as well. So the command is something along the lines of Python 3, Dir Search, dash URL, and then we're going to do HTTP. And of course, I had already copied the HTTP, so Let's do that. And then I like to search for, well, we know that it is, uh, it's running Apache. I'm gonna do PHP and HTML on this. And then I'm gonna exclude a few things. I don't want to come back with any 400s, 401s, or 403s. And before I run this search, we'll go out and just show you Dir search. Actually, I'm gonna execute this and I'm gonna go show you Dir search while this is searching. So if you want Dir search, all you gotta do is go to Google, Type in Dir search, and you can see the first link that comes up is right here. This is a great, I will put this in the resources of this video as well. Uh, and all you gotta do is follow the instructions. Just do a git clone on this, cd into Dir search, and then execute Dir search. No installation, nothing really needed. So it works very, very well. And this is gonna run. We'll see how it does here. It's at 30 or so percent. We'll see how it does. I'm gonna go ahead and pause right here and then I'm gonna come back. So you pause as well if you need to. Uh, if you're following along, if you already done this, then just go ahead and keep watching the video. Okay, so the task just completed and you could see here that it brought back a 301, which is a redirect on simple. So let's go ahead and just open this link and see what happens here. It says home, pen test it, and it says CMS made simple. So this is a simple CMS. We got version 2.2.8. You can search exploit this. You can do whatever you want. I'm gonna make it bigger so you can see down here. But CMS made simple version 2.2.8. So if we go out to the Google machines and we just say CMS made simple, ah, look what comes up, 2.2.8 exploit. I have done one of these before, I remember it. Um, so I know that there is, and we can see here a SQL injection vulnerability that was discovered. And yes, this is 2019-9053, so it's actually fairly recent. Let's go ahead and go to the exploit database and see what they've got. And here we go, 2.2.10 or older, we've got SQL injection. So let's go ahead and see what they've got. I'm gonna just download this Python script, it looks like. So I'm gonna download the Python script, save it, and what it's saying is we're going to need a URL, a word list, and uh, a dash C for crack as an option. So let's go ahead and go over to our downloads or wherever you save it, CD to downloads, and I'm going to just Python 3 this and see what happens. And this one was 46635.py. And maybe it's just Python, not Python 3. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, so we need to specify a URL. Example usage, no cracking password. Example usage with cracking password. 
and we need to provide a word list. So what I'm thinking here is we do a dash u for URL, and we just go we go HTTP, and we'll grab this URL that we found. Actually, we'll just grab this whole thing, and I'm going to paste this back into here. And then we're going to do a dash dash crack like it says, and then we're going to do a dash w, and then we need a path to a word list. I'm going to go ahead. So this is going to try to crack passwords of hashes that it gets and pulls down. I'm going to try with the worst 100 passwords. So I'm going to go out to Google. And if we do worst 100 or how about top 100 sec list is my favorite. You could see 10 million password list top 100. So that's the one I want to use. And again, I'll link this in the resources as well. But let's grab this data, I'm going to copy it. And then I'm just going to open a new tab here. And I'm just going to do gedit top 100.txt. How about that? Paste and save. And we'll see if this one works. We'll go in and then I'm going to provide that word list. And then we'll just do top 100.txt. Should have saved should be there. See if it works. OK, and I'm going to let this run and we'll see how we fare when it's all said and done. So uh, go ahead and I'm going to pause the video on my end. If you're just watching, go ahead and keep watching. All right, so we get the results back and we get a username. We get an email. We get a password hash with the salt. It didn't crack for us. So it looks like the 100 word list is probably too small. We probably needed something a little bit bigger. Uh, we can copy this and kind of go out and see if we just go to Google, if there's anything out there for it. Uh, I already did a little bit of looking, but yeah, you could look through like MD5 lists or you could see that there's MD5 hashing. You can go check and see if there's any sort of uh, word list out there. Now, it did pull up on the simple CTF that it was secret. We absolutely could go back and do this again with it being... Um, with a, a better word list or a longer word list. This just took about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to actually get through this part. So I'm going to let this just kind of go this time. We'll just do secret, but just know if you got it, good job. You utilize the right word list. If not, um, Google is your friend. You can search for these things, hunt it down when it finds the, the hash like this as well. So I'm going to go ahead and just cheat a little bit. We're going to go and now try to SSH into this machine utilizing the credentials that we found. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to try hack me and copy this address. And I just want to try to SSH here. So we're going to say SSH and we'll do Mitch at and then we'll just paste this. Then we're going to go ahead and do port 2222. We'll type in yes to accept this. And then we're going to say secret as the password. All right, and now we are the low level user. So let's talk through methodology here. What are some things that I told you would work really, really well if you were attempting a machine? While we're on here, we can try quickly just doing history and seeing what the history is. No history found. We could do LSLA and we could try to cat the bash history if we want and see if that works. OK, so we see the user flag here. Um, you can see somebody made the user flag. Good job. Keep up. Uh, you, so you can see a little bit of history from whoever was in here making this box, but no credentials or anything. So next thing I want to check is sudo dash L. Quickly check that. And looky there, we've got a root no password of user bin vim. Where have we seen this before? We have seen this before with the pseudo challenges. So what might we do here? Well, we can do a GTFO bins. Remember the GTFO bins? And we can just go do that real quick. GTFO bins and see what happens with the uh, with the Vim here. So I'm just going to do Vim. And we'll do pseudo. Click on that. And pseudo Vim here. Let's try it. See if it works. OK, got some weird stuff back. Let's see, ID, are we still? No, nope, we're root. It worked. Just did some weird stuff there for a second. So 
It did elevate us. There are other ways to do this, by the way. You don't have to do, we're executing a command. So there's a way if you just go sudo vim and you go into vim, um, and then you come in here and you just do bash. You do an exclamation bash when you come down here like this. You should be able to exit and be on bash as well. And see, here we are as root. That would work just as fine. Um, but this little one liner command worked as well. So um, things to think about, takeaways there. But this was your first challenge. So we're going to continuously do boxes through here. And of course, if it's in the pseudo section, pretty good chance that it was going to be pseudo. So uh, my hope for you at this point was that you used your simple enumeration skills that you've learned so far, and you took that and applied it to this machine, and you were able to root the machine. Uh, it was pretty straightforward in sense of how to find access. You just had to do a little bit of directory busting, get access to that, and then just be really patient with the exploit because it does take a while. So um, after that, you get on the machine, and you can see that getting root really wasn't that bad. It was something that we actually had seen before, and you now have a little bit more practice. So from here, we're gonna go ahead and talk about a couple of different CVEs that have recently come up in the last year or so. Uh, so these are 2019 CVEs, and they both apply to sudo. So we're going to cover those, and we actually have walkthroughs for those too via TryHackMe. So let's go ahead and cover the first one. I'll meet you in the next video, and we'll discuss it more in depth. Okay, on to some more recent vulnerabilities. So this first vulnerability is from 2019. You can see the release date on this is 10-15-2019. That is less than a year ago at the time of recording. And you can see the CVE was 2019-14-287. Now this one's a nice little walkthrough. And you can see here that it just says, hey, we're going to run sudo-l and then we're going to get something back and when we get that back it's going to say all exclamation root bin bash what does that mean well when it says exclamation root it means not root so what it's saying is this user hacker here cannot run bin bash as root so if you want to take a look at what the sudoers looks like in sudoers you could see that it says hacker does not have root access to bin bash and then we could actually exploit this. So because of this does not have access to root, there is a specific vulnerability that was discovered. Now, if we take a look at the vulnerability, all we have to do is type in sudo, then dash u hash dash one bin bash. And then guess what? We execute as root. Very straightforward. I am seeing this all over the place right now, and I'm seeing it all over the place with capture the flag events too. So. Definitely something to keep in mind, keep in your back pocket and put in your notebook because this one is common, okay? And so what is it doing? Why, why do we care? Why is this happening? Well, it says here that sudo doesn't check for the existence of the specified user ID and it executes with the arbitrary user ID with sudo priv. So when we do this, it returns as zero, which is the root ID. Now, we were doing a live stream not that long ago and this vulnerability came up and somebody in the chat was asking, hey, what happens if you change it to something other than negative one? Can you take over any ID? And the answer is yes. Say you have a user ID at like 1003, and we want to change that ID. We would just put a plus sign here and do 1003. Now, it only works for the user one time, and, and we'll transfer over to that user, but we can't go back, if that makes sense. So we would have to only perform the sudo from where the sudo exists. But we can use this to take over any user with this vulnerability, which is super nice. However, of course, we're gonna to wanna to take over root, but if we wanna take over somebody else, we could too. Just a little side tidbit. Uh, but here, negative one's going to put us right at zero, and we will be the root user, since uh, that's where it goes. So let's go ahead and go to a box. I'm gonna go ahead and have you go to Hacktivities, and then I want you to type in sudo. And I'm gonna have you spin up this box, give it a few minutes to load, and then we're gonna get connected in the next video and actually test this exploit out. So pseudo security bypass, make sure it says 2019 14 287. Go ahead and click on this. I just actually joined the room not that long ago and deployed the machine. So go ahead and get in there, join the room, deploy the machine, and make sure you can access this machine. So I will see you in the next video when we actually cover how to exploit this.
All right, let's test this one out. So they actually give us, for this box, they give us the low-level user. So we don't have to do any exploitation right now, which is okay. But we come through here and we can do, uh, just copy this IP address here. And we'll go scroll down just a little bit into this tab. And you can see the username and password are try hack me and try hack me. So I'm just gonna open up a new window, make this larger. And then what we'll go ahead and do is we'll just SSH to try hack me at, and I'll paste that IP address. And then we'll do this over port 2222. Okay, I'm gonna accept the fingerprint. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do try hack me. Let that work. And here we are, we are in. So remember, we're gonna do a sudo dash L, list out those privileges. And you can see what's in here for us. So we've got this, this looks familiar, right? The exclamation root, bin bash no password so we shouldn't be able to run this but guess what we can so i'm going to cheat just a little bit i'm going to go in here and just copy the command that we need to run but i will paste it give you time to actually do the same and of course i will provide the resource for both of these i'll have this other one in the in both videos just in case but uh so go ahead you're going to do a sudo dash u pound sign dash one or a negative one, space, bin bash like that. Go ahead and hit enter. And guess what you are? You are the root user. So you could say ID and we are root. Now, if you want credit for this machine and you wanna get some points, you can say, okay, here's the flag. So there's going to be a flag here. We can run bin bash. So I won't do all these with you, but just cause it's a short video, we'll go ahead and capture the flag and we'll go in and we'll grab that root flag as well. So let's go ahead and cd over to root ls and we'll cat out that root.txt, capture that. And of course it's leet security bypass. So we'll copy that and get credit for finishing this room out. Cool, easy enough. So we got one more of these to do. It is another 2019 CVE and make sure you're taking good notes on these because they might show up again. All right, so just a little little foreshadowing for the future. But uh, I, I will see you in the next video when we move on and look at 2019 18 634. All right, we're at the last video in this section. So we're going to do another box from Try Hack Me. So if you come to activities again, all you have to do is type in sudo one more time. And now there's this sudo buffer overflow, which is CVE 2019-18634. Again, this is another exploit that has been released within the last year. Very relevant, and I keep seeing it all over the place. So let's go ahead and just join the room. And we're going to deploy this as well. Now, while we deploy this, I'm gonna kind of use their guide to kind of help you understand. I'm just gonna say we've deployed, and then we're going to SSH into this machine here in a second. It should be same credentials as well. So let's go down to the buffer overflow, and you can see here that we have this CVE, and when they actually look at the sudoers, and you're gonna see a sudo-l here in a second of it, but when they look at the sudoers, there is a environment variable here that says PW feedback. Now, if you've ever been typing in your password on a Linux machine and you see that asterisks are in place of nothing, usually when you type in your password, nothing happens. You just don't see anything. But if there's actual little asterisks being typed in there, that's the PW feedback being set. Okay, so when the PW feedback is set in a very specific version of sudo, it can be abused. Now there are certain versions that are vulnerable to this and we're going to do it on one of these here now. So if we actually scroll down, let's go ahead and take a look at the box. We'll log into the box and then we'll talk more about the exploit itself. So let's go ahead to a new window. I'm gonna copy this real quick and then I'm going to log in. Just do SSH, it said port 4444. And then we're gonna do try hack me at, and we'll do the box IP address. Say yes. Okay, so if I'm typing in try hack me right now for the password, you're not seeing anything, right? So just imagine that's how Linux typically works. 
But in this instance, if we were to try to change password or if not change password, we try to log into maybe say sudo. Let's see if it works. We'll switch user into root. Nothing there. So that didn't work. Let's try sudo switch user into root and see if that works. There you go. See the asterisks? That's that PW feedback right there. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit enter. It's going to ask me a bunch of times for the password. I'm stuck in this for at least one more enter. And then, OK, so after this, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to clear screen now. So let's do a sudo dash L and take a look at this. Uh, we'll do try hack me as the password. And we may not run sudo, so we can't see that. Let's see if we can cat out the Etsy sudoers. We have no permission there either. So what about the version of sudo? So let's try doing a sudo dash capital V. You can see we're on 1.8.21 P2. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this CVE. I'm clicking in here. I'll provide a link for this. But if you Google the CVE and click on any of the links, it says, hey, any sudo before 1.8.26 was vulnerable to this. And what did we just see? We saw 1.8.21. So definitely a vulnerability here. So how do we identify this? If we can't run sudo shell, we can't see the environment, we can't see sudoers. Well, I think the only way to really do this is with a sudo switch user, right? We say sudo switch user and we try switching into a different user and you saw the password being there the PW feedback was enabled. So something to check for, something to think about, especially if your pseudo version here is below 1.8.26. So it takes a little bit more digging, maybe some hey, gotcha kind of deal because it's not out there and apparent. But if you do see that when you're trying this on a box, then you might know, hey, I might want to go check for this vulnerability. So this is one again that's been coming up. I've seen it on quite a few CTS recently. So, OK, we have the vulnerability identified. How do we actually exploit this? Well, there are several versions out there that are vulnerable uh, or vulnerable. There are several exploits out there made specifically for this. Now, TryHackMe has gone out and actually put the file in here. They've compiled it. They've shown you how they've compiled it if you're interested in that. But they're using this specific one right here. So um, they're using this one. I will link this as a resource as well. And they have the C code here. If you want to read the C code and you understand the C code, it's quite long and not as easy as your typical buffer overflow. Uh, but there is a buffer overflow that exists in this in this box here or in sudo that allows this to happen. So here's what's going to happen now. We're going to run this C code and see what happens. So if we go back into the machine and we just do an LS, we can see we have exploit. Let's go ahead and just Try to run that exploit. OK, it says try again. And you can see we ran ID and now we are root. So that's really it. This is just an example of one more modern privilege escalation technique that you might start running into, especially against older machines. Now, again, that PW feedback has to be enabled. So if it's not enabled, this one you might not really see. Uh, there are some versions, especially if you read through this try hack me write up. It's a really nice write up. And they talk about some versions where this is automatically enabled by default, which is Linux Mint and elementary OS. So if you see that on one of those, then you might run into that there. Uh, but chances are it's it's going to be one of those you have to kind of dig for. But I would be on the lookout for it simply because it is so new. It's so modern and it's going to be utilized. I feel like at least for the next year or two. So. That's it for this lesson, and that's it for this section. From here, we're going to move on to talking about SUIDs and how we can escalate via SUID attacks. So I will see you over in the next section. Now let's talk about SUID, or what is known as the set user ID. This has to deal with permission settings. So if we take a look at something like LSLA, and I'm just on my regular uh, SSH connection that we've been working with in this lab, you could see here that we have our read, write, execute, this read, blank, execute, read, blank, execute. So these are our file permissions. 
All right, and then we could tell if it's a directory or a file here. Now, how do we operate these or how do we read and understand these? So they're in three sets of groups, right? So the first group here is the read, write, execute of the file owner. This is the read, write, execute of the group. And this is the read, write, execute for everybody else. So you can see who the file owner is here. And then you can see who the file owner for root. Let's take an example of, let's try lsla on Etsy shadow, which is going to be something definitely owned by root. So you can see root owns this. Now root has read, write privileges on this. The group also has read, write privileges on this. And then we just have read access. Though in a perfect world, a normal world, we would not have any. Remember, this is intentionally vulnerable here. So we would not see any read write access here or any read access. Now, what can we do with this information or how does this information pertain to us in SUIDs? Well, we have options, right? So if say we wanted to make a certain file executable, we could do like chmod plus x on that file, it would make it executable. Or you may have seen something along the lines of chmod 777. And that stands for across the board, I want read, write, execute. And why does that Why does that do that? Well, if we look at this from a bits perspective, we can have four bits here for read, two bits for write, and one bit for execute. So what does that equal? If you add all those together, that equals seven. So if you see seven, that means, hey, on the first group or first set of three, I want seven. And that says, okay, read, write, execute. Well, if you saw four there, then you would just have read. Or if you saw six and you have read, write, seven be execute, of course. So you could do that. And that's a, a way of thinking about this and kind of understanding it from a bits perspective as well. So now in comes the SUID permission or the set user ID, which allows users to execute a file with permissions of a specified user. So the files that have SUID permissions run with higher privileges. Now, if we were to set a UID on this group right here, that would be an SUID, okay? And just stay with me. You would see an S right here. If we were to do a group instead of an SUID for the user, if we did a group, that would be called an SGID, and you would also see an S here. And the last one, if we were to do it for everybody else, you would actually see a T here, and that is known as a sticky bit. For this course, in this lesson, we're going to focus on the SUID or hunting down this S in that location. Now, not everything is vulnerable that has the SUID permission set. You kind of have to dig and learn and understand what files have these permissions and why they have these permissions or, you know, if it's vulnerable or not. So, of course, we can use GTFO bins for that, and I'll show you how to do that here shortly. But... Let's go ahead and delete this out and let's run a command to kind of hunt these down. How would we find these? How do we hunt these down? So we're going to do a find command and then we're going to do a forward slash, which is saying, hey, we're going to start from the top or the root of the file system. And then we're going to say dash perm for permissions. And we're going to state what permissions we're looking for. So we're going to say dash u equals s. So we want all the files owned by the root user, and we're going to have an S here, right? So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that S. So with that, we're going to say what type we're looking for. We're looking for files. And we're just going to throw this into dev null, meaning it's going to go into the abyss. And we're going to go ahead and search for this. OK, and we get a bunch back here. So we see different types that have coming through. and. OK, we've got sudo, uh, sudo edit, password. We even got ping. And some of these are just standard. We, we're used to seeing them. And you'll kind of learn these over time. But let's take a look at one. Let's look at this chsh. OK, so let's copy that. And let me just, let's do an ls-la just on that file. I want you to be able to see and understand exactly what I'm talking about. So if you see this, look, rws, we have the suid here. Remember, if we had an S here, that would be an SGID, and then a T here would be a sticky bit. So what we are hunting is the S here. With that one command, that's it. You run that one command, you hunt it. Now, when we're hunting these down, we could easily do this with a tool such as LinPs to run and hunt these down. 
However, I again, I want you to understand the manual method, the reasoning behind what we're looking for. And then once we tie it all together, we can go to something like GTFO bins dot github dot io. All right, and we come in here and we can look specifically for SUID. We can click on SUID and see which ones have SUID. And we can just compare, compare and contrast to what we've seen, right? If we do the find command again. Okay, so sudo password, g password. I'm just going to pull some of these out and see if maybe there's anything in here. Let's go with, well, I see nano. Nano's in there. I don't see password. I don't see g password. Is sudo in here? Sudo is not. Was nano in ours? Uh, nano was not in here. So you'd have to hunt these through. But that's okay. I'm going to give you a sample of this, and we're going to have tons of SUID samples here coming up soon. So again, not all of these are going to be vulnerable, but at least one of these will be. And we're going to find out here shortly um, how we can take advantage of different SUID vulnerabilities. But before we do all that, I've got a challenge for you. So we're going to do another box off of Try Hack Me. Let's open up a new window and go to Try Hack Me. And this is a great box. This is part of their uh, security or offensive, not offensive security, just I guess offensive path, uh, certifications path. And if you go to learning paths, they have these learning paths here that are great. What is it called? Offensive pen testing. That's it. Uh, offensive pen testing path. So if we actually go into the uh, activities and just search for this, we come in here and we just type in vulnerability. Now, this kind of tells you a little bit of what it's about. And if you have any confusion on anything, there's actually a walkthrough video here. But it tells you kind of step by step what you're looking for, how to compromise the machine and even talks to you about the SUID and the sticky bits. I think it's a great, great example. However, I want to challenge you to do this on your own. So try to do this on your own. Just come in here, deploy the machine, completely do it on your own, and give it a go. And then once you do, uh, if you get the low level user, go ahead and uh, try to do it all the way through. In the next video, we'll cover how to compromise the foothold. And then once we compromise the foothold, we'll cover how to hunt down the SUID, what we're specifically looking for, and how to take advantage of this. Now, in this instance, we're not going to try to get root. I'm just going to cheat a little bit and tell you. The goal here is not to get root. The goal here is to take advantage of something within the system to go ahead and get root. So your goal is to capture the root flag that is in the slash root folder, and the root flag is called root.txt. So your end goal is to capture slash root slash root.txt. OK, so go ahead and try to do that. Once you do that, meet me back, and we will go ahead and cover the walkthrough and how I would have done it. So I will see you in the next few videos. All right, let's take down another box, shall we? So looking at this Nmap scan coming back, we have port 21 open, which is always something of interest. We should go see if we can log in anonymously, of course. Port 22, again, SSH, I'm not really concerned about unless we find credentials to log into this machine or there's a vulnerability here. I just don't see it. Uh, 139, 445 is always of interest too. If we can SMB client over to Samba and we could see if we can log in anonymously, that's always a good option. Uh, the 3128 is a proxy, but 3333 is HTTP and it looks like it's hosting a website for Voln University. So if I'm doing this box, this one stands out right away. So I've been debating back and forth. Do I want to show you looking for 21? OK, we well go out to FTP and try to look. I think you're at that at that point if you're already in this course by now. You would go search FTP, right? That would be my methodology. Just do the quick wins, FTP, and do 139.445. Just see if SMB client has any information. You could also use something like Metasploit or another tool like Enum for Linux to come in here and just see what version of Samba is running. But it's actually pulling down 4.3.11. So we, we have some some information here about this and version information. So maybe there's a vulnerability related to that. I would be checking versions, of course, first, low hanging fruit, anything. But this Vuln University stands out to me like a sore thumb. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be a rabbit hole. However, given the the machine, and this is something that you have to look at too, is you have to look at the machine. I think this one was rated easy or maybe moderate. I don't think that it would be a rabbit hole. So you just have to kind of gauge that as well. But with that being said, I'm going to just kind of skip ahead and I'm just going to copy this IP address and go ahead and go out to this port of 3333, see what's out there. 
Okay, so we have this Vuln University website. And we don't have a lot of information on it. Um, so when I'm on a website, especially like this, this looks like a legitimate website. I want to usually open up Burp Suite. I'm going to see where the links go. But if you're looking at the links, like if you can see down below, the links are all going to just um, just right here. So it's a pound, so it's just not going anywhere. So unless I could find something here that's of interest, I don't. I don't think this is maybe where we want to go. I think we're probably going to do something that's going out to Vimeo. Uh, it looks like none of these are really going to uh, be of of interest to us. So I would load Burp Suite, especially if I had Pro. I would load Burp Suite here and just see where it goes. Let's see where the subscribe goes. Right back to the top. Yeah, nothing here of interest. Um, we can load Burp Suite just in case, and we'll hit OK. And I'm just going to close this out, go next, start burp. I've got the foxy proxy over here, so I'm just going to use that to uh, set my burp proxy settings. And then I'm going to refresh this and take the intercept off. I'm also going to add this to scope really quick. So if we go to target, actually, I can just right click and add to scope. And then from there, I'm also going to just say show only in scope items. Let's do that. OK, so now we got this. Now, in theory, the item should be loading here. It's pulling down any sort of data it's finding from the HTML, or it's crawling, kind of crawling. We don't have the full crawl feature anymore because that's a pro edition kind of deal. Uh, so we don't have that. But we could still do some directory brute forcing while we're kind of going through the site and seeing if any of these pages load anything. So I, I kind of want to do that. And I'm going to use, again, I think I'm just going to use the Brute Forcer we've been using. So let's go ahead and CD over to opt, and we'll do dir search. And same kind of syntax, Python 3. We'll do dir search. We'll do u. And then I'm going to copy this address here and paste that in. All right. And then we're going to just do, let's see, Does do we have any information on this website? Um, I'm not seeing any information in regards to this website. So we will just do HTML for now on this one and see what, what pops back. I'll do E HTML and we'll do exclude 400, 401, 403. All right, so we'll let this run, kind of see what comes back, if anything. And so go ahead, we'll pause the video or I'll pause on my side and then we're gonna go ahead and come right back. So if you're following along, go ahead and pause and then meet me when your scan is done. OK, we're back. And if you look at this, CSS doesn't stand out. Fonts, images, JavaScript, I mean, th those don't really stand out. Uh, JavaScript might be something of interest if we're going to take a look at some of the, the JavaScript that's there. But first and foremost, I think internal stands out the most. So I'm going to open that and see where this takes us and in what journey. Oh, it takes us to a file upload. That's perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and try to upload to this. Um, so let's do an example first. Let's go and I'm going to go to downloads. And this could just be like as a, you watching for now. But I want to try to upload shell.php and just kind of see what happens. It says extension not allowed. So we're not allowed to upload the shell.php. OK, if we can't upload .php, maybe we can upload some other file types. Um, let's go ahead and try doing a PHP on this reverse shell here, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, so we already have a, uh, well, we have PHP we can go grab. So if we go and do something like, if we go to Google, I've got a couple on my machine, but I'm going to show you how to, how to grab one of these. I like using the uh, PHP reverse shell from Pentester Monkey. So if you've never grabbed this one, the Pentester Monkey reverse shell or Pentest Monkey, if you click into this and just copy it, and I've got it a little enlarged, all you have to do, if you scroll down just a bit, where you see the slash slash change this, all you got to do is change the port you want to use for reverse shell, and you just need to change the IP address to your IP address. OK, so I'm going to open up gedit here on one that I've already got. And all you got to do is copy and paste this and change that. So I'm just going to gedit. Actually, I have it in downloads, CD downloads. I'm going to gedit the shell, and I got one for PHP 5 that I've used. 
Uh, my colors are all funky, but that's okay. We've got this 10.11.4.114 is actually my IP address, and actually 7777 is fine for me too. This is one I've used in a, another video, but we're going to go ahead and keep this because my IP address hadn't changed. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. And what we'll do with this file is we're going to go ahead and try to upload it. But what we're going to do when we upload it is we're going to take Burp Suite and we're just going to intercept this. Okay. So let's go to file upload. I'm going to upload the shell.php5, which is just a different type of extension. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to submit. And there's a couple things that we can do here. So we can send this to repeater, copy and send a repeater. And you can see that it's taking the, the file name here, right? So we can send this and see what the response is. And it says extension not allowed. All right. So the other thing that we could do, we could sit here and just keep changing this until we find something that might work. The other thing that we can do is we can come in here and we can go and just right click and send to intruder. And we can use intruder instead. So if we clear this and we just highlight this .php5 here, we can hit add on that. And we'll just use a sniper attack, which means we're going to one off attack this specific area that we just highlighted. So what we can do is we can take a bunch of different options and let's go ahead and do that. We're going to go to payloads and we could just say something like, well, we know PHP doesn't work, but there's also PHP three, there's PHP four, there's PHP five, which we just saw didn't work. There's PHTML. Uh, so if we're trying to do, there's actually a PHP six as well. Uh, so we could just try to go through this if we're trying to do PHP. Just because the PHP itself, the extension's not there, doesn't mean that we can't utilize different PHP here. So we're going to try different extensions to try to bypass this extension and see if that works for us. Now, the other thing that we caught from repeater was this extension not allowed. So we can copy this. I like doing this with my intruder is we can go over to options and scroll down. This grep match right here, I like to clear that and say yes, and then we'll just paste for extension not allowed. And then I also like to follow redirections down at the very bottom, I just say always. And then we can just come to start attack here. So quick, quick recap, we've intercepted the request, we've selected this file extension because the issue is on the extension. Remember, it's saying extension not allowed. So we're gonna try to fuzz the extension and we're gonna use these payloads. So it's gonna send this request four times and it's going to say, hey, try it with PHP 3, try it with PHP 4, try it with PHTML, try it with PHP 6. Okay. And then it's going to grep on the output that we chose. So I'm going to start this attack and kind of show you what that looks like. It's just saying, hey, you're using Community Edition. We're going to slow down this attack because we want you to pay for this. All right. Looking at this, there's a couple things that we notice. We see that uh, two different things, right? 737 on the length for everything except this PHTML. So there's a different length here. We could sort by length and just check and see, okay, did one change on length? It did. Another thing to look for is status. Sometimes the status code is different. Like you might see a 301 redirect or have redirects here. That would indicate a successful attempt as well. The last thing that we could look at is this extension right here. So it says extension not allowed. Well, this one didn't trigger a check mark where the rest did. So this is kind of where that grep comes in handy, especially if you're doing really, really long lists and the lengths aren't as accurate as these ones are or as concise or together. Uh, so what we're going to do is where it looks like this PHTML worked fine. OK, so we've got PHTML. I'm going to turn this intercept off and I'm going to refresh here and see if there's anything. OK, so we just got the file upload page. So what we should be able to do is see if we can get to like an uploads or something along those lines um, now that we've uploaded this file. So let's go ahead and try this. Actually, let's upload and just see what the standard look is for this. I'm going to rename this really quick. Actually, I'm going to go rename it in the folder itself. Uh, just make life easier. Where is it? Downloads. And then I'm going to rename this to PHTML. And then we're just going to put this through and see what happens. Submit, and it just says success. So we've got nothing here to indicate where it's going. Chances are it's going to like an uploads folder. So we can uploads and see if that does anything. Okay, and you have it here. If you didn't know where this was, you're like, how did he just get to this? Uh, it's very common for there to just be an uploads folder. However, if you need to hunt down 
you could again run something like a directory bust on internal itself and you would definitely find this upload. So just to save time, this is one thing I would guess or I would just try to take the, the next step and brute force the internal directory itself. So we got the shell.phtml. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a netcat on NVLP all sevens. And then I'm gonna click this link and hopefully things go well for us. Okay. And you could see ID of UID of 33 data um, PWD. We are just at the base here. LS. Okay. So we are in as this www data user. We are the low level user, which is expected. Now, from here, if you weren't able to get this far, but you still want to try to progress this machine, take what you learned in the video before this one, try to hunt down the different types and try to get that flag. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna be able to search for SUID. Something should stand out via the methodology that I taught you, and you should be able to utilize that to get the root flag. Meet me in the next video. We're gonna cover exactly how we do that. All right, let's pick up right where we left off. So I'm gonna go ahead and just paste that command that I used in the first video. If you need a second to go ahead and type this out, type it out. Remember, it's just that find command. We're looking for that SUID bit set, and we're gonna go ahead and uh, search for that. So we can go ahead and just hit enter. It's going to do some searching. It might take a second to get through the entire box. And you can see it came back with quite a few things, all right? And some of these look familiar again. Pseudo, chsh, password. These are ones we saw on the last one, right? Uh, but if you went through this list, as I kind of told you to do, and you went through the GTFO bins, you should have found one that stood out. So let's go ahead and go through GTFO bins. And if we just do on the SUID capability, we take quite a bit out. Let me scroll down to the one that you were looking for. It is system CTL, okay? System CTL is the one that you're after. Now, if you come in here, it gives you a nice description. It says it runs with the SUID bit set and may be exploited to access the file system, escalate or maintain access with elevated privileges working as an SUID backdoor. So we have options here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, run the commands that we see here. We're going to modify this just a little bit and we're going to uh, use this to execute. Let me make this a little bigger just so you guys can see it. So we're gonna run this sudo sh, okay? And then from there, we're going to uh, do this, this command here, this just set a, uh, a variable. And then we're going to echo out this line here through the very end. Uh, line by line, we'll take this. And then from there, we should be able to do this system link and then system enable that should execute everything. Okay, so let's run through this line by line really quick. So we're gonna create this environmental variable, right? And we're just calling it here, they're calling it TF. You can call it whatever, pretty much whatever you want. And we're doing a make temp dot service. So we're making a, a service, a system CTL or system D service, okay? That's what this dot service is. With the make temp, that's a command that we're going to use to create a temporary file on the system as a service. So we're gonna come through here and we're going to echo the command starting out. Now, when the service starts, what's gonna happen is we're gonna call out bin sh, and we're gonna execute a command with bin sh, and that command that we're going to run is not going to be id, we're gonna say, hey, go ahead and just run, and we're going to say forward slash root forward slash root dot txt to grab, uh, we'll put it into the temp output, that's fine, and that should, in theory, output our root flag to the output folder, okay, or to the, to the output file in temp. Then lastly, we're going to install, and what we're gonna do is we're going to run this at the run level of multi-user.target, and that's going to all be put into this right here, this environmental variable, variable of the target file, or TF, um, as get, I'm guessing is what they're calling it, but we're just gonna call it TF here, uh, that's fine. I've seen people call it other things, but it's literally whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to use this link command here. So what we're going to do, if you read the man page of the system CTL, this is just setting up a link. It's making our file available for uh, for running via system CTL. 
And then here in layman's terms, we're going to enable this. If you want to find out more information about all of this, you're welcome to read the man pages and go further. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive into making this exploitable, okay? So I'm going to copy this whole command, and I'm just going to paste this into a text editor. Now, you won't be able to read this very well, but I'm going to walk you through line by line as to what I'm copying and what I'm pasting in. So let's go ahead and just get this over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this. I'm going to delete out this one shot. We actually don't need this one shot. I'm going to delete out this ID command as well, because remember, we're executing bin sh. I'm going to actually put in here cat, and then we're going to do root root.txt. So I'm going to execute cat root root.txt and just get out the flag here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call this as a full path. So we're going to say bin forward slash system TTL forward slash. And then we have the link there. We're going to do forward slash bin system CTL as well. OK, so I'll paste this slowly just in case you didn't catch this. I'm going to copy this here, paste this in. That's line one. OK, line two starts the echo. And we might be able to paste this in all at once, but I'm going to take it line by line here. OK, good. We see the greater than symbol, which is what we want to see, because we're going to paste this all in at once, kind of, or into the echo command, I should say, until we close it off with the second apostrophe. Go ahead and copy this, paste this. All right, we've got the dollar sign back. Now we just create that link. Okay, symlink is created, and now we enable this. Okay, it said created symlink. Now this should have gone to temp output. So in theory, if we cat temp output, we've got a root flag, and that's it. So from start to finish, again, we took advantage of the SUID bit being set, meaning as a user, we're able to execute something special as somebody uh, more privileged than us here being the root user. So we're able to take advantage of that SUID bit being set. And because of that, we're able to escalate our privileges here. So that is it for this video. In the next section, we're going to go ahead and cover more SUID escalation. We've got shared object injection, binary sim links, and environmental variables. So we'll kind of talk through those and see what we can do with all three of those. So I'll see you over in the next video. Okay, we have reached the conclusion of this condensed course. Again, if you just got through all of this, you are now through this SUID portion here. We have, again, other SUID escalations, capabilities, scheduled tasks, way more Linux privilege escalation to go, including that capstone challenge. So if you're interested, this course is $30 on our academy, and I'll drop a link to that in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking it, subscribing to the channel. We drop videos and course content, and educational content all the time. So we would love to have you as a subscriber. Outside of that, I won't keep you any longer. I thank you so much for joining me through this course. Hopefully you learned something and found some valuable information here. And I'll see you over in the next video.